Okay, good evening and uh, welcome to our, I guess, regular schedule of meetings again. We've had a couple in the, in the summer special meetings, but this is uh, the first one, uh, our first back on the regular schedule after the summer break. So we'll call the meeting to order. You all have an agenda and uh, we need an approval of the agenda. Moved by Ted, seconded by Guy. All in favor? Well, first I should ask, does anybody have anything to add before we approve it? Seeing none. All in favor of the agenda? Signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded. Carried. Anybody have a conflict of interest declaration? Seeing none. We'll move on. We have presentations. The first presentation is from uh, Rebecca Rose, Community Navigator for Doctor Recruitment. So Rebecca, if you're ready, you're on. Perfect. Okay, let me um, let me share my screen here. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. The Municipality of the District of Argyle is a key member of our Navigator Partnership. And as such, I welcome a few minutes of your time to update you on where the Navigator Project is at the moment. This presentation is made available to you along with a few additional slides that provide information we may not be able to address today. So for a bit of background information, in March 2019, the Chamber of Commerce determined that available health care was critical for economic and community growth. And as a result of approaching many members of the community, a partnership was formed with the stakeholders listed here. Monthly, the Oversight Committee and Navigator meet to ensure that the direction and actions are consistently moving forward. As, there's, as this is a completely new uh, position, Sometimes the road is a little bit bumpy, the meetings get a little bit long, but we continue on the same tack. So what is our current status? We could see this crisis coming, which is why we got engaged. Our community's waiting list has grown from 873 to 3,661 in Yarmouth, Pubnico and Barrington in the past 24 months. So let me explain some of the reasons why I think that this has happened. First of all, our outgoing physicians outpaced our incoming physicians for four years, and we lost six family physicians and seven specialists during that time. Second of all, doctors retire, current patient, loads, patient case loads are smaller. We had a lot of people that were not registered on the 811 list who are now. We've had additional people move here, physicians leave for their own reasons, and basically, with all of these things, Yarmouth really needed its own promoter to sell Yarmouth. So how did it happen that we needed to help with doctor recruitment? Well, healthcare restructuring took a massive toll on recruiting and some of our doctors felt the need to recruit themselves, but that's not their job. Um, so we needed someone to take over, to step in and be that central funnel point. So, here you can see some of our challenges, and they're the same as many rural communities in Nova Scotia, such as physician allotment, increased migration, um, housing, long-term pandemic restrictions, and retirement. And I want to focus for a moment on worldwide competition for physicians. This is not just a Nova Scotia problem. This is not a Southwest Nova problem. This is an international issue. Family physicians are not being graduated at the same rate that they used to be. Um, and so this is an issue across borders. Now the prime directive of this partnership and the navigator is to drive recruitment and retention. So these two concepts in my opinion cannot be separated. From my first contact with someone, I want them to feel like choosing Yarmouth is easy. If they feel welcomed, valued, and accommodated, it can create a real sense of ease. And when undergoing such important life decisions, such as where to study, where to practice, where to live, or move your family to, 
this is very, very important. Now, thanks to COVID, recruitment has shifted from a high touch, low tech activity to a high touch, high tech activity. And communication has become much more complicated. Before COVID, I could develop rapport with someone over a handshake and an in-person conversation. But with COVID, developing trust with a person half a world away is very challenging. Not to mention the fact that we live in a world which is full of internet scams and distrust with cultural bias, communication differences, and individual frames of reference that all need to be maneuvered around. Now, at any one time, the Navigator has eight groups consistently being handled. We have our local high school and medical students. We have three levels of medical learners coming through our community. We have three different levels of physicians. And with so many groups and needs, how do we get competitive? Well, competition for physicians is not simply a matter of financial incentives that will bring people to us. We've tried that and it doesn't work. It must be multifaceted. So these are seven keys that we have identified to effectively recruit. So we need to up our recruiting game to make sure that we're communicating what we need to. We have to raise our profile. We attend virtual conferences. We develop um, out of box retention strategies. We use social media analytics to fuel the information base that we have, and we keep track of what is working and what is not working. But basically, all of these retention strategies can be summed up in one sentence, which is stay in touch with everyone and do whatever needs to be done. So here's a slide that has some activity photos of what physicians and their families look like as they are experiencing our community creating relationships, and I'm gonna add strongly, achieving their own goals. So their own goals of developing lifelong friendships, of graduating from um, a fantastic program that we have here, or from experiencing different levels of education on different rotations throughout their education. Look, Tuscan Island Tours. That's like a huge favorite to all of them. Now, one of the most important things we continually work on is raising Yarmouth's profile. So our new medical learners residence, which is currently under construction on Vancouver Street, provided to us by Coastal Financial Credit Union, has had a massive impact in drawing medical learners to us. It means that for them, for medical students to come to Yarmouth, it's not putting them at an economic disadvantage because they want to try their hand at rural medicine, which is in an area too far for them to commute daily from Halifax. So that's a, a big deal. Um, we have helped create a community navigator working group, which is now a recognized partner in physician recruitment by Nova Scotia Health, Dalhousie University and immigration. And very importantly, we were called on to advise government on effective measures for rural recruitment. Um, I did this in March and I made a presentation to the standing committee on health and it was very well received. Now, for social media analytics, which help us keep track of what works and what doesn't, I've included some um, visuals for you to take a glance at. So here's an example of our virtual conference page. So um, a number of virtual conferences allow us to load very specific information this echoes our website that we are um, still uh, finishing developing. This is um, an image of the front cover to our website. And these are some instances or examples of our Instagram posts. Now, this is a site that the Community Navigator Partnership has put together to really promote rural medicine. So let's talk about how this approach is working and how we're doing. Well, we've gained 13 family medicine doctors, 10 specialists. Uh, we have four from our graduating class uh, in July, June, 2022 that are looking and are currently in negotiation for contracts. We just started a new group of five family medicine residents. Um, 
12 out of the 14 most recent family med grads are staying here in some capacity and our community is growing. So are we moving forward? Our incoming doctors now outpace our outgoing doctors. This positive climb has begun and in reality, we have a great COVID location. We do still need more doctors, but we are well organized and well positioned for continued success. Now, I have a little video. I'm not sure if it's gonna let me do that. Let me see. Um, no, it's not gonna let me do this. So this is included in the document that I sent to you guys all to take a look at. I know you're in a tight timeline, so I'll let you take a look at it at another time. What we've done is we have created a number of videos that help us with virtual recruiting. We've completed a, a virtual hospital tour, which goes through the number of departments with department heads. We have a, one for our community. We have one for our residency program. And we have a site clinic tour for um, one of our family medicine practices in town, um, which has ample space to take on new uh, practices. So um, I do want to add one thing that um, I didn't I'm just going to stop sharing if that's okay. There we go. One thing that has changed from the time that I created that presentation, and that's the same presentation that I gave to all the stakeholders, is that we're starting to see a transition in some positions. So some people that started when our project started a couple of years ago, their families have reached a point where they are starting to move for their own reasons. So either a student is starting university in Ontario, so the family moves or, or things like that. So from now on, I'm gonna start looking at net gain for family medicine doctors and net gain for specialists because we are still starting to, starting to see that kind of fluctuation. So our net gain for family medicine doctors is seven, five of which have started full-time family practices. And our net gain for specialists is uh, at four, but we have another one that's coming on October 2nd um, with his family to the area from South Africa. And then our net gain will be five. So that is where the project is. That's how we're trying to facilitate recruitment and retention in our area. Um, and if uh, people would like to contact me at any time, feel free to do so. I'm always open for input and for questions. And if anybody has any questions now, I'm open to that as well, according to, uh, to what, uh, the, what you'd like to do, Warden. Anybody have any questions? Councillor Surratt. Uh, Rebecca, good. You're doing a, a great job. I mean, I, I don't follow this all the time, but when I'm glad you came and gave a report because a lot of people are asking, you know, a lot of questions. Uh, question for you, I don't know if you can answer or not. When you started this job, uh, in the back of your mind, was this a two year to get, uh, to get physicians? Was this a five year, 10 year? Or did you have some kind of a goal behind it? I, I know it's a hard question. Um, I didn't really have a great idea in terms of the timeline because I didn't really know exactly what I was walking into. It's probably a good thing. I didn't really know what I was walking into. A little bit of a quagmire, um, a little bit of politics, a lot of budget, um, and then COVID kind of flipped everything on its, on its ear, so to speak. I would say that, um, that the trend is great. I don't know. I don't know how, and I'm not bragging me up. I don't know if it matters who the person is in the seat. I think it's just important that there, that there really is an engaged person in that community navigator seat and that we have consistent direction with, um, with the oversight committee because we haven't done this before. Um, we do get consulted on a regular basis because we are ahead of the curve in terms of our navigator partnership and how we approach things. Um, I would say that, I would say I would expect that 
we need to put as much time into this for success as, as the amount of time as it was neglected. So this was neglected um, and kind of absent through, um, not absent, that's not really fair because there, there, there were some zonal influences. Um, but because of centralization for five years, this was not a focus um, for the area. Um, and we need to sell ourselves and we need to sell ourselves, like we need to go hard and we need to be open-minded and pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope of, of where we are and what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I would like to see a commitment in my, in my mind, it's a five-year commitment because that's how long it was neglected. I think we've got to get back to, to uh, ground zero and then move from there. But what I'm starting to see now that we have some success and some models for this kind of recruitment and retention are working within physicians and working in terms of the, the agencies that are involved. So Doctors Nova Scotia as one. Um, I'm having other healthcare professional um, groupings, I guess we'll say groupings, kind of reach out because we have created this and they are struggling. So for example, um, respiratory therapy, you know, we need, we need some RTs here. Um, and there's some other professionals. I've, I've had people um, approach me with regards to um, uh, not naturopathic nurse practitioners um, and nurses overall, as well as some other kind of allied health specialties. It's a, it's a long haul. It's, it's a long haul. And I think we really need to make sure that we continue to be at the forefront, that we continue to push those envelopes and that we become the rural medicine center that anybody who is practicing rural medicine in Nova Scotia wants to be at. Does that answer Thank your you. question? Thank you. Oh. Anybody else? Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good presentation again, Rebecca. Uh, I honestly don't think it's going to be just a five-year deal. I honestly am looking at uh, the community navigator doctor recruitment. That could easily be the community navigator specialist recruitment. And I honestly don't think this day and age, if we can ever go without a person like yourself working there. Uh, now I'm not telling you you've got this is your retirement job like don't you know nothing like that uh, won't be held responsible but honestly and you said you didn't want to break yourself up but I know you've been doing a great job I've been hearing it and I know your heart and soul's into it so thank you it it it, it is this is a uh, it's a job uh, but it's very much a passion project for me and um, I make a point of uh, I'm trying to take care of our communities. So, yeah, thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Um, Rebecca, yes, a great presentation. Uh, we talk about recruitment, we talk about retention. So uh, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how, uh, how we can, as community members, uh, help with the retention. I'm just thinking, you know, out loud, uh, you know, a doctor from uh, South Africa coming to Southwest Nova, uh, what are the, the things that they're looking for, not just in their profession, but in their family life, in their activities, in their hobbies, you know, and I guess I'm a, a, a hunter and a, a fisherman, and how do you link a guy from South Africa or, or a gal from South Africa to come here and go whitetail hunting with somebody local, not just me, but somebody else, right? And how, how do we... You know, how do we link that? Well, so so one of the great things about uh, virtual recruiting now is we have I have many contacts with these with new physicians coming to the area, investigating the area. Many, many, many contacts before they get here. So I already know what he's like. I've already met the whole family, the kids, the the spouse. You know, I already have a really good idea for what they what they need and what they're going to be interested in. Um, 
one thing that I did learn recently in the last six months, which I was quite surprised at, I had a physician coming from the UK who's here and is settled now and working in our emergency departments, and which is great. Um, so he was looking for housing. So I found what I thought was the like a beautiful house, a lake in the front, lake in the back, beautiful cathedral ceilings, affordable. And um, they were very intimidated by that because they're not accustomed to that. Um, and they would have felt, if I'd left them there, they would have felt isolated. They would have felt unwanted and they would have felt, um, they were fearful. They were like, there's no neighbors around to protect us. Like, so, so it's kind of a, a mindset all the time, right? Um, trying to get to know people so I can best suit them to those parts of the community. So you wanna know how you can help, I'll tell you. The Mariners on Main, getting that open. Um, funding for that is huge because swimming and some of those sports are things that are international. So not having a pool, not knowing when we were gonna have a pool, that was, that was a bit of an issue for some people. Um, your, your council, I have reached out and from time to time and to individuals and said, hey, I need this. Uh, where can I get this? Or I need you to attend this or, you know. So being present, being accessible to me makes my job easier. And that makes, that makes my ability to, to settle people, to connect them, to link them, to help them feel comfortable, welcomed, valued, and established is important. Um, I think I've said it before, our community is extremely friendly but we're not necessarily as welcoming as we could be because we all have relationships that are longstanding. We have cousins, aunts, uncles, right? Um, so, so for our community to remember to put themselves in the position of somebody new to the community, if you're new to a community, yeah, you would absolutely love an invitation to go blueberry picking if you've never done that before or an invitation to go out on a fishing boat but maybe not too far from shore because if they haven't been they're not they, they might get sick I don't know you know like just those kinds of things invite them into the circles which is what I would say to your to your viewers on Facebook invite newcomers we have a number of newcomers that have come here as a result of COVID from Ontario other parts of like BC Alberta um people that have bought properties sight unseen. And, and you know, they have jobs that they can do from wherever. We want them to stay. We want them to, to feel connected and we want them to become part of our community moving forward. So find ways to reach out and answer the phone when I call you. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? Comes for Sonia. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. You've been doing a great job. I see you, you're turning things around is, is very good. And you've answered part of my question with Calvin's, um, or Calvin's question about sports and stuff like that. Uh, my question is more on education. Is uh, nothing's more important than our kids. So I'm guessing when the doctors come, they're educated themselves and they want to see the best for their children. So we don't have the university except for St. Anne's. So, but, uh, you know, pre-college pre, pre education in Yarmouth, does it, does it meet their criteria? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think every junior high and every high school outside of a private institution, and maybe even a private institution, it gets a little bit ragged from time to time. Um, they're not necessarily the most warm, buzzy places to spend your days if you're an adolescent. Um, one obstacle or one challenge, excuse me, that we need to work around are, are kind of equating the different school systems. So the UK system versus, versus our system here, um, trying to, to get people to figure out where those kind of levels are. But I will say this, the International Baccalaureate Program that is offered at um, YCMHS is a fantastic seller because there are not a lot of rural communities 
um, in Nova Scotia that have it. In fact, I think we might be one of two outside of Central Zone that have that program. And so a lot of highly educated physicians or other professionals who want their children also to have those opportunities, um, you know, that's a big, that's a big selling feature. The fact that we have two languages um, well established in our community for, for education in French or in English um, and all the variations between early immersion and late immersion and schooling in French and schooling in English. And that's also a huge selling point because for a number of individuals coming from overseas or wherever, sometimes um, they come with their own biases and to see two to three um, uniquely in unique cultures and language bases living so well together and sharing so well together is also very, um, it's very uh, impactful for them because, because really we are a lot softer and a lot more open than a number of other cultures that they're coming from. So, um, so education is key being near St. Anne's, promoting the fact that we have French and English and the IB program. And the reality is we're never too far from a university. So, so I think we're actually in, I think we're actually in pretty good stead. I've only known one physician that had to leave um, this community because of education. And actually he continues to work from here. He just does it virtually um, a couple days a week and he's in town a couple days a week. His family's actually living in Windsor because he has a high, uh, he has a child with special needs who has to attend Landmark East. So we do what we can and we try to accommodate their family's needs for education the same way as we would anybody else. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Uh, Councilor Albright. Thank you, I just wanted to say that um, your presentation was really, it was, it was perfect. It was, you know, to the point and, and, and very explained the whole process, but what, what the team doesn't know is how much you've put into this. Uh, when we, when we decided on this, this position, you know, we, we weren't quite sure what it was going to look like as you weren't quite sure what it was going to look like. And we all put in money, but I feel like we've gotten way more bang for our buck with you. You've done an amazing job and and our council doesn't even see all of the things, you know, having been on the doctor recruitment committee, I know how much work you've put into, into this. And I know the creativity, um, trying to come up with new ideas to, to engage the new physicians. Like it's just, it's, I'm really happy to be part of that committee and I'm, I'm glad we made the right choice in hiring you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, Oh, I see our CAO. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, I had a question regarding the residency program. Yep. So, oh, I'm gonna say about five, six years ago, the residency program came in um, thanks to, um, uh, well, I think it was, it was there were two doctors in particular that really were instrumental um, uh, in, in developing that. Uh, and so what is our retention, like, what does that look like? What has that looked like from the start to now um, in terms of like how many come in and how many are retained? So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, our Nova Scotia trained physicians um, are our easiest uh, recruitment target, uh, not target, that's the wrong word. Um, uh, group, let's say that group, because licensing is already established. They don't need to, to pay to get licensed here as well. Um, so when we started, I believe we only had two residency positions in family medicine. We now have 12 family medicine residents here at any, sorry, 10 here at any one time. And we always have two internal medicine fellows that are now rotating through here as well. Um, so basically, even, even the residents who don't end up staying because, because they have roots wherever they have roots, um, their positive word of mouth is really starting to have an impact. Um, 
I'm looking at I'm looking at our residents. I'm going to say we probably have an 80% retention rate of our of our family medicine residents, and that's because I'm now talking about net gain, not overall have agreed to stay, and then three years later they're moving on to whatever. Um, but the word of mouth is huge, and something that's happened over the last couple of weeks, which is really interesting, um, in the spring, in the in the winter, actually, we decided as a partnership um, that we really needed to start advertising as a community, separate from Nova Scotia Health. So our website tags to Nova Scotia Health, and they're more than medicine, where which is where all the postings are listed. But we have our own Facebook um, advertising program, and we. We advertise through um, anesthesia conferences and obstetrics conferences, and we're gonna start with pediatrics because we need pediatrics. And so we're actually getting cold calls now from people who've seen our advertising someplace. So for example, last week, we had a physician um, who is in, uh, she's in the UK, she is a nephrologist, and she found out about us. And, I don't even know exactly how she found out about us, but she was able to connect with Dr. Moses specifically. Four days later, she's flying from Montreal to Halifax. She's driving from Halifax to Yarmouth. She spends the day with us in the hospital and on the community tour, community tour, which is basically, uh, I don't really have a formula. We just go through everything, trying to find the right fit to make sure that they know exactly what they're getting into good and maybe less good about the community because you don't want surprises setting up that initial contact and presenting the truth and being transparent and um, supporting that is very important because not everybody does that a lot of people try to hook through deception and um, I think that's why there's there's it takes a while to develop that kind of rapport with somebody across the world because I literally, if I'm looking at real estate with somebody or an apartment, I have to show them in real time with the video that it's me and this is my phone and this is the place because otherwise it can so easily be manufactured that they don't really know that what they're seeing and what they're hearing is actually true. So um, so for our, Nova, for our residency program, we don't have to do that. They can see it, they can feel it. We have two years to show them and for them to discover whether it's a good fit or not. Most of the time they've had those experiences during their medical school rotation. So they've already come here for residency. They know what they're getting. So because of that, our retention rate of our residency students and residency graduates is very high. Does that answer your question? It, it does. I remember at the time that it was created, uh, Dr. Casella did a presentation to this council. Some of them were, were counselors at the time, most were. And she said, on average, you retain between two to three of five. So at the time, the for year one, there were only five. And then, of course, year two, another five. Yeah. And we've, been, we've exceeded that. Um, our, our net zero, our net zero energy uh, just, just shut the lights off. Apparently, I'm not moving enough. Um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> uh, net zero movement, I guess. So, um, so uh, essentially, uh, she was saying two to three, and we've we've exceeded that I think every year, and I think we have, yeah, we have every single year. Our last graduating class, we kept four of our five in some capacity. Um, one went on to Truro because he had a contract there, but he maintained his hospital admitting privilege, his hospital privileges for here, so he can continue to come back and do locums because he loves it here. The other person that we didn't keep full time has gone on to do more education in Ottawa and is hoping to come back once that education is done. So that was last, that's this past year. The one before, we also kept four out of five. So those are the only two years that I've been involved in the program. So if we've gone from two out of five to four out of five, I'm loving that. Now, yeah. over time, some of those will, will leave, but that's life, right? They should be allowed to leave. <laughs> we'll get we'll get five more every year and hopefully retain no it, it's excellent thank you so much for that and, and it's 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 you know in, in part of a, of, a, of a team of people which you are a very key person as well. so just want to thank you for that as well thank you thank you okay. um okay uh comes to board draw
I don't have a question, Rebecca, but I uh, just want to tell you you're doing an awesome job. Uh, it's great to see that people are coming in for this community. Awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, when you say you retain them, not necessarily army, what's your, mm -hmm. what, what is your, your, the, the area that when you say in our area, what, what does that cover? So our area specifically related to my stakeholders, because although I support, I support the areas on either side, I'm focused on the areas that are, that my stakeholders have contributed to, right? So Yarmouth, Pubnico, Barrington are, are our areas. Claire, um, technically Claire's, different. They have a different uh, recruiting consultant from Nova Scotia Health, but we work very closely with them. And I'm not going to draw a line there because many of our family medicine residents who are training at the Yarmouth Hospital also do time at the Clare Clinic. So, so they're, they very much fall under my umbrella as well um, for, for that reason. Um, if you look at the statistics from Nova Scotia Health uh, on their you know, how are we doing or how many people don't have doctors, they, they clump Yarmouth, Pubnico, Barrington together as an area. Shelburne is separate, Clare, Weymouth, separate. So that's why I report on that number because it's most accurate for, for us and our community and our neighbors. Now, very recently they hired a part-time, uh, they've allotted part-time hours, I should say, to the navigator position in Shelburne. So that gives me somebody that I can connect with there because the reality is Shelburne's only an hour away, but I don't know the community and I don't have the connections there. Okay. Um, and there's also a navigator since the last time we all met here um, that covers Digby and up to the valley. So, so getting that support on either side of Southwest Nova at this point, um, is going to make my job a little bit easier. And as they kind of come on, we started with only three navigators. I was number three to join on. Now we have 10, I think. And next week, um, I'm going to a, an actual in-person conference in New Brunswick. Um, that's just residents. So these are people that may be doing the residence someplace that they may not necessarily have been their first choice. And so they're looking for what their options are when they graduate from their residency program. And so that's a great opportunity. I'm bringing Dr. Lasher, Erica Lasher Coates, one of our first graduates and a preceptor. She's coming with me. And, it, and then I can kind of connect that person with, with other residents who have chosen to stay here because they're very new to the field and they're very new to the way things are operating now in terms of um, healthcare in our area. And so any questions that a potential, that a graduating resident might have for coming and setting up practice here will all be able to be addressed kind of in real time. It's fantastic. Okay, yeah. I, I, I thought it was a, a, a larger area. I thought for some reason that it was a tri-counties. Jeremy Digby, it, Jeremy Digby and Shelburne, but I guess not. So when you say we're retaining, we're retaining in a very localized area close to us. Yes. Good. Yes. Very close to us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't see anybody else raising their hands. So as they've all said, everybody has said how uh, great, great presentation. You're doing a great job. We're seeing results, which is, which is when you're doing something like that, results is what you're looking for. And it seems like we're getting that. So thank you very much for the presentation. And you're welcome. Uh, good luck in uh, getting more to, to stay in this area. Thank you. Let's see what the, uh, what the new government structure and the new Nova Scotia health structure comes that's, up with, right? We're doing a lot of reorganizing and we'll be meeting with them at the end of September. Um, I made it clear that we needed to have an audience. They needed to hear what we had to say, what we have created, um, and some really cutting edge ideas that we have to serve our medical professionals here. And um, my intention and my partnership's intention is to keep us on the forefront, to 
to keep us out there and to keep us uh, to to make us the place medical professionals want to be and to keep us at that forefront. So, so yeah. thank you. If anybody has any questions at any time, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I appreciate all the feedback. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We will now continue on to our second presentation. And this is Jared from WSP Development Agreement Review. He's got a couple to go over. So Jared, whenever you're ready, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Share screen here. So the first step is a development agreement application uh, for micro cannabis production processing facility by Muse Cannabis Limit on Surrets Island. So just for context, before we kind of get too into it, a development agreement for those watching from uh, Facebook, it's essentially a, a contract the municipality would do up to permitted development on a given site. Uh, it's similar to zoning, but it's a bit more tailored. So it lets us look at um, setbacks or if there's any, um, let's say, hours of operations that we may want to look at as part of the, the development. It's a bit more uh, fine grain that you might get with the traditional zoning. Um, so that's really the difference here. And it's a discretionary application, so we're looking at its first reading on that. Uh, the site's at 129 Tittle Road, and the property is just shy of 11 acres. Uh, it's what was a, a previously a medical uh, cannabis uh, greenhouse. It's essentially proposed to be expanded to include a large greenhouse, a um, smaller greenhouse, an office building, and some storage on site. It's actually under construction now. You can see it from the attached fit picture here. Um, more of a planning context, kind of what's going on uh, and how it fits into kind of the, the overarching policy framework for how the municipality looks at development. Uh, the property is zoned coastal community at the moment and adjacent properties nearby are also zoned coastal community. Um, there's some areas that are called coastal wetland zone in the land use bylaw, and those are areas that are wetlands or low lying uh, and subject to flooding for the most part intermittently, um, which isn't applicable to this site, just so people understand kind of what that, what that means there. Um, really for this application, uh, it's kind of initial steps moving into the public hearing, uh, which is the formal yes, no decision prior to the decision of council. Um, policy 337 of the municipal plan uh, lets council look at this. Um, and because it is a development agreement application, the decision of council uh, at the end of the day when it does take place would be um, subject to appeal. So if the developer did not receive it, they'd be able to appeal if it didn't meet the decision of the, the policies of the municipal plan. Um, similarly, uh, if it was approved, um, there would be appeal options um, for like, what are called agreed residents. As people that had concerns regarding the proposal. Um, there's a larger staff report that's attached that gets into the municipal planning policies and initial look at those, uh, which is on the council agenda here this evening. Uh, and I won't get into those right now. Um, just for context about why this amendment is necessary, um, in this coastal community zone, all uh, cannabis applications or micro applications for production or processing um, are subject to what's called this development agreement uh, approach for approval. Um, what that use actually is, um, it's defined under the Cannabis Act with the federal government. So they're permitted to have a maximum of 200 square meters of grow area. So they tend to be smaller um, like productions. A lot of the time people don't even know they exist. Um, particularly when the, the requirements under the, the Cannabis Act uh, come into play with regards to smell and so on, which I'll get into right now. So if approved, uh, this application would permit the growing of cannabis, processing of cannabis for wholesale use is what, what's called a licensed producer. Uh, also selling cannabis for medical purposes. Uh, so those authorized under Health Canada. And then uh, just for context, so this is, this is a really a, like to grow uh, cannabis for the sale. It's not actually to sell it on site. Um, so that still goes under the NSLC, of course, um, through our provincial requirements and so on. Um, the Federal Cannabis Act requirements um, also would apply to this. There's kind of two layers here about how um, a building would have to get used or a land use would take place. Um, under the, the act, uh, any building used for cannabis production or processing is required to have air filters to prevent the escape of odors associated with cannabis to the outdoors. And when this is first kind of coming into play, I, I'm sure people are aware of some of the complaints in the media as people are kind of figuring out how to do this well. Um, 
so this is the technology has changed a fair bit since we kind of first started to see the type of land use. And I would just mention there is um, kind of a, a federal mechanism to be able to uh, look at the approvals and kind of the operation over time. So these um, federal approvals actually have a duration of two years and they're not automatically renewed. So there's a, a mechanism to kind of look at them again after a two year period if there's a, like a not compliance issues or so on and so forth with uh, the act requirements. Um, as a development agreement application, um, there is a public hearing required before the formal decision of council, as I mentioned previously, and we'll be doing some public engagement to get the word out about that, uh, advertising in the Vanguard, um, and then um, also putting a sign on the property and uh, sending out a mail out to uh, residents with 152 meters. So they'll get, up, like, get like a letter basically summarizing the application. Um, furthermore, if anybody has any questions or comments, um, happy to answer those in advance of the public hearing. Um, oftentimes it's for these type of development agreement applications is the best time is prior to public hearing to kind of get into any concerns people may have, because uh, that's kind of when we're still drafting these agreements um, prior to us doing the decision of them. So in terms of next steps, uh, we'll continue with our public notification. Uh, there'll be another meeting of uh, council where the public hearing will take place. And then typically following that meeting, uh, there'll be the formal go or no go from council. Uh, and then the, the appeal uh, period would open up. Uh, we're aiming for October 12th, both for this application and then the, the subsequent one I'll present momentarily. So I'll present that one right now which is a land use bylaw application for rezoning to light industrial and mixed use zone along the Chemin de Rocher in Middle West Pubnico. This one's really to fix um, some zoning that's taking place there. Uh, there was three lots that are proposed to be consolidated. So the lot boundaries would be adjusted to make two lots. Uh, which shown here would be lot V1 and lot V2. Um, they, there's going to be a subdivision application, which isn't part of this application uh, before you. This is really just to fix some of the zoning. Um, right now, there's a, a dwelling on the property as well as an accessory building and a lobster wire trap operation. Um, and there was some historical zoning that it doesn't quite mesh up, although it does follow the property line. So there's a property line going through one of the buildings at the moment. Uh, so really, we're looking to kind of rectify um, some of those, that, that lot fabric that's there today. Um, in preparation for this, um, this rezoning and this uh, subdivision application to take place. Uh, so right now, there, the small rectangular property there is owned light industrial. And what would be looking to take place is for that zone to actually be what's shown as the proposed lot V2 here, and for the remainder of the property on lot V1 to be rezoned to mixed use zone. Um, so it's really just a zoning fix to, to, to fix some lot boundaries. Um, similar zoning to a lot of kind of um, West Pubnico in the, the rural center area, um, some light industrial as well as some uh, mixed use zone. So really the no additional buildings or uses are currently proposed for the site. It's really to match up the zone boundaries with the future lot boundaries. And just in terms of what could happen in the future in terms of development uh, intent, um, we do permit accessory houses um, to a light industrial use in that zone. So there may be a house that happens in the future if this application is approved. And that's just showing the current light industrial zone boundaries with the proposed ones. Um, similar to the above, uh, basically this is a, this amendment is taking place to rectify what are, what's called a split zoning issue. Um, what happens there is that there's specific requirements that limit kind of your ability to expand um, within the Municipal Government Act. So this fix would really uh, end that and make everything compliant, and permit them to come in for kind of traditional permits as you would expect, uh, rather than this kind of more limited approach. Um, and then the risk of it, if it burned down as a discontinuation of like the lobster trap use, for instance, uh, it would be quite difficult to, um, to kind of have a new use come in. Uh, like if you're gonna switch it over to a home or wanted to switch it to another light industrial type of use. So uh, really around uh, the current area or the proposed properties area, it's a lot of mixed use zoning with light industrial zoning. For kind of the policy context here, the rural center designation within the municipal plan establishes a number of designations, including the light industrial, the mixed use, uh, and there's a heavy industrial zone, all, all of that's not being considered here. Um, 
light industrial zone is already established um, and no really expansion of that's being proposed. And the proposed change would better bring the properties in conformance to the land use bylaw, aka the zoning, as the existing uses would be fully within their respective zones. And each lot would meet, meet their minimum lot standards. Uh, some of the, I won't get into this one again, it's the same uh, as what was kind of presented previously. Uh, we uh, have a sign on the property now, and we're looking to go to a public hearing uh, in a couple of weeks uh, on uh, October the 12th. So it's really setting us up for that, uh, assuming council proceeds with the first reading here tonight. So end that one. And then we also have a memo. Um, so just to go over, there's some questions and comments from the public about Maybe we'll pause there if anybody has any questions about this application before we get, get into this. Okay. So are we okay to move on or what are you waiting for? Yeah, I think I was just going to see if there are any questions on those applications, but it appears okay. there are none. Okay. So that's, yeah, let's keep going then. Um, so for the, the memo, it's basically just a summary of the, so there's an aquaculture use proposed uh, and a proposed change to the municipal plan in Yarmouth, uh, at the district of Yarmouth, I should say. Um, and there's just some questions with the public about um, kind of jurisdiction. I think there was just some miscommunication about where it may be taking place. So it is in the district of Yarmouth. Um, there is currently a public hearing date being set for the first use, which is um, a lobster holding facility. Um, so that'll be on September 22nd. And then there's some subsequent um, approvals taking place at the moment for how they would consider aquaculture uses uh, within their municipal plan, as well as um, for a salmon farm uh, proposed use. Uh, so those are kind of they're running through their kind of um, municipal plan approvals processes at the moment. I just want to point out there is also a federal and provincial process that will be taking place. Uh, so there'll be a number of engagement opportunities I foresee um, for this council at later dates, if they want to um, make any recommendations or have any comment regarding any of this. Uh, so that will be really kind of the, the item under consideration now is the billing approval. And there is kind of a joint provincial and federal um, system in place for dealing with the actual environmental approvals. Um, we had some discussion at planning advisory committee uh, earlier today actually as well, um, where we'll be taking another look at how we actually proceed with approvals of this in our, our own municipal plan and land use bylaw. These are permitted as of right. Um, so anywhere where it's an approved use, someone will be able to come in and apply for a permit here today, um, which is typical throughout most, most of the province. Um, this is really a bit of a, a new land use for much of the area uh, with some changes that they've been doing with the aquaculture requirements at the provincial and federal level. Um, so we'll be taking a look at those. So you'll likely see us come back to, back with some uh, proposed changes on those to council. And I would just like to point out if any councillors are interested, um, that public hearing date is uh, Wednesday, September 22nd. So if there's any comments um, specifically on the municipal approvals, um, for that lobster holding facility, they can make those via a letter to um, Modi Council. There's also the opportunity to, if you wish to be involved on in kind of the environmental approvals, which in my opinion is kind of the, the larger question here, uh, it may be worth a letter from Council to uh, the Aquaculture Board, uh, who will ultimately be making the final decision kind of on the, the uh, provincial and federal environmental approvals. So. That's it for those. Okay. Any questions on any of those? We can we can we can take one at a time here. Is there any questions on the Muse uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, report or or application? Councillor Shrey. Uh First, a, a comment. I live about two hundred meters from where the uh, micro cannabis is. And so I would have a first hand of, I guess, what's going on there. And uh, I can say to all of council that I've never received one phone call, one complaint or anything at all, not a word on the street, anything at all, nothing whatsoever on this. I can, you know, I was expecting maybe something, but, but nothing at all. 
That's not, I can vouch for that. Uh, secondly, question to Jared. Uh, the public hearing, will that be in Surrettes Island at the community center? So through you, we had proposed to do one um, public hearing, uh, likely at council chambers with Zoom. We're still kind of figuring out the details on that because we have about five applications we want to run through that evening. Um, yeah, so it's we. If it was a desire of council, we could uh, take a look at that. But uh, as it stands now, no. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on that one, Councillor Doctor Wong? A uh, question for uh, for Jared on the one uh, in Middle West Balmico. Um, yep. Just wondering. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of of how we go about. Uh, I guess advertising. Uh, some of the houses that are close by, do we send them letters or how does that work? Yep, through you um, to the councillor. So we'll send out letters to everybody within 152 meters, we'll do Facebook postings. I think we might be doing like an actual poster up, probably like in the municipal offices. Um, and then letter. Uh, we also have a, an ad that will go in the paper for a couple of weeks prior. So it's those are, we try many tools. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Digden. Uh, I don't have a question, but I'm willing to make a motion. I'm not sure. In uh, our agenda, it was the Dion, then Muse, but it was presented uh, Muse, then Dion. So I'm not sure if you're ready for a motion on the Vernon Dion uh, land use yet or not. We can, well, we're going to have to make motions on 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 both of them, but I was okay. just going to see if there was any more questions, and then we can we can move on to the uh, to the approval or, or or the motion that we require for this. If there's no other questions, we are ready for we we you you can make motion and recommended motion. Which one do I have here? I can um, through you. I can put it on the screen if you like. Let's see here. Okay. Okay, this one. Here we go. This is for the rezoning. So motions, uh, they're they're basically the same except uh, different locations and different different applications, but the motion seems to be the same thing and it's basically there as a recommended motion. Mm -hmm. That uh, um, plan, planning, planning advisory committee, uh, and they are recommending this to council, by the way, that they give that council give first reading to consider approval of a land use bylaw amendment to amend 23, 25, and 27 uh, with those uh, PID numbers to rezone the portion of land as proposed lot V2 to light industrial zone and rezone the portion of land as proposed lot V1 to mixed use zone as indicated in the planner's report. Proceed yep. to a public hearing with the second meeting planning advisory committee unless substantial comments are, are received from the public and authorized staff to schedule a public hearing for the application. That would be the motion. That's the motion I'd be making, sir. Okay, that motion is made by Councilor I'll, I'll second it. Seconded by Councilor Dottermall. Any discussion on the motion? I can't see, so if anybody has anything to, to say, just speak up. Hearing none, I'll ask for the question. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. I can't see or say aye. 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 Contrary-minded. Carried. Okay, so we need a motion on the, on the Muse one. And basically, it's, it's, it's basically the same. It's uh, the planning advisory uh, committee made a motion to recommend that council give first reading to consider approval of a development agreement to permit a micro cannabis reduction processing facility 
on PID 9035510, proceed to a public hearing without a second meeting of Planning Advisory Committee unless substantial comments are received from the public and authorize staff to schedule a public hearing for the application. And we'll need a, a so move. move by Councillor Surrett. Second. Seconded by, was that? Uh, Kathy. That was Kath, uh, Councillor Bork. Any discussion on that one? Question. Question called. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary minded, carried. Now, on the letter for 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 the um, for the for Modi for the municipality of Yarmouth on, on their uh, application, if we if we want to, we can we can uh, uh, um, send comments or questions to that uh, to that hearing that they're going to have public hearing. So, doing in doing that. If we want to do that, we will probably have to send a letter. But that's all. That's just for the that's just for the upcoming uh, public hearing. That if you have any questions or any or any comments that you want, we can do that as a council, and it would have to be done through through a, a written uh, request that we want that uh, to to go to the hearing. So I don't know what what's the wish of council on that. I, I would just, I would just say leave it alone. To let, to let it go, to, 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 no. I understand not to do anything at this point. Okay. If that's, if that, if they're agreed, then we don't need a motion for anything. We just, we just uh, let it sit the way it is. Okay. So that concludes that presentation. And the next presentation is from uh, Grant Thornton. And it's our consolidated uh, finances, uh, financial statements. There, we're finally to you, Gloria. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for your and I think I'll, um, I think Alain would have uh, emailed you out a copy of the statements, but I think Alain's gonna share his screen so that uh, we can follow along. On it, uh, the statement would have been attached to the agenda, would not have been distributed by email. Oh, okay. Now. One moment, please. Oh, I just closed it. Oh, this took a while. But I. Consolidated first, Madame. I'm just doing consolidated, yeah. Yeah. Can everybody see that? Not yet. It's coming. It says you shared your screen, but it's kind of black. All right, just give it a moment. Yeah, it's just thinking. I'm going to try that again. Okay. There, can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Okay, wonderful. You can go right to the independent auditor's report. So just as a refresher, uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, so these are your audited financial statements and in, accord in accordance with the auditing standards, they have to be on a consolidated basis. So they are a little bit different than what you see on a regular basis as presented by staff because they take into consideration all of the operations of the municipality of Argyle, which would be your operating fund, your tangible capital asset fund, your operating reserve and your capital reserve. We add those all together, but then we also bring in your share of the operations of your controlled, what we call subsidiaries. So the other organizations that you partner with, they are the industrial commission, the airport, the Yarmouth County Solid Waste Management Authority, and YASTA. So we also bring in your share of their operations as well, and we add them all together to produce this consolidated statement. Um, and that way you can see the overall picture of everything that you're involved with. 
So right now we're on the independent auditor's report. So this is our letter to you um, as council on the results of the audit. And so it is a clean audit opinion. We didn't find anything while we were doing our audit, which would cause us to have to modify the report or the contents of the report or the way the report is written. So the first two paragraphs are the opinion. So it is the statements for March 31st, 2021. And the second little paragraph, it says, in our opinion, the accompanying consolidated financial statements present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of the municipality of the district of Argyle as at March 31st, 2021, and the results of its operations and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. So that's our formal opinion. It takes us a couple of pages to say that, but that is the, the essence of our opinion. Opinion. and public sector accounting standards is the framework that you fall under. In terms of the basis for our opinion, we are required to follow Canadian processes when we do our audits. So we have to properly plan and implement our audit. And at the end of the day, we believe that the audit evidence that we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our opinion. The next little section is on the responsibility of management and those charged with governance. So it is the responsibility of your management team to prepare these financial statements in accordance with the public sector accounting standards. It's also their responsibility to set a system of internal controls that they feel is appropriate in the circumstances to make sure that these financial statements are free of what we call material misstatements. So that's what we're looking for when we do an audit. We're looking for errors and, and omissions to make sure that we can make them as accurate as possible. They also are responsible for what we call looking at the going concern assumption. And so that's your ability to continue into the future to pay your liabilities with the assets that you have. And then lastly, those charged with governance, which is essentially your audit committee and US Council are responsible for the oversight in the municipality's financial reporting processes. That's not a day-to-day -day basis, but that's that high level overview. And then on the next page, you can see the auditor's responsibility for the financial statements. So our main goal is to obtain what we call reasonable assurance. And reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance, but it's not 100% guarantee. There might not still be an error in the financial statements. Um, and that tends to happen when there has been fraud involved in an organization. So in order to kind of get that risk down to as low a level as we possibly can, you can see that the processes that we go through um, and the first one is that we identify uh, and assess the areas of highest risk. And that's where we spend the most of our audit time is looking at those areas of high risk because that's where there potentially could be an error. And if there's one there, we wanna make sure that we're able to find it. We have to look at your internal control processes. We don't audit them, but we have to understand how they operate um, so that we can potentially make recommendations for improvements if there's areas where, where things can be improved on. We have to look at your accounting policies, first of all, to make sure that they are in accordance with public sector accounting standards, and secondly, that the ones that you've chosen are actually being followed in your day-to-day -day operations. We also have to uh, conclude on whether or not we agree with management's assessment of your going concern, which is your ability to continue into the future, which of course we do. We then evaluate the overall presentation because besides the first few pages of numbers, there's a lot of information uh, contained in the notes at the back of these statements as well. So we have to look at them as a whole and make sure that they're appropriate. And then also because we bring in uh, your share of the proportionate assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses of the subsidiaries, we have to make sure that the audit work done on those individual entities is also appropriate and appropriately reflected in these financial statements. And so we com may com communicate this information to those charged with governance. Um, and so they are dated today. Hopefully council will approve these financial statements uh, at this meeting. The next page three. So under public sector accounting standards, management is expected to take responsibility for these financial statements in writing. So this is their page that is also written to you, which tells you just what they take responsibility for. Um, and it's a very standardized format. You'll see it's very similar in most organizations around Nova Scotia. And I won't go over it in detail, but basically it is management uh, signing off that they take responsibility for the financial information. Then on to page four, 
Um, so we did meet with your audit committee yesterday and we went the, through these uh, numbers in detail as well as the notes at the back and the supporting schedules. So tonight I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of the first two or three pages, which are the, the most important pages, but I am open to any questions that you may have um, after I'm complete or, or while I'm, I'm presenting. Um, so this is what we call the statement of operations. So these are your revenues and expenditures and you can see it's broken down between your budget your actual for 2021 and your actual for 2020 as well. So we compare to budget and we compare to the prior year when we're looking for unusual items. Um, and so you can see that it is broken down into the different categories of revenue. So your original budget was set at 9,873,227 for revenues and you came in at 8,242,167 and the prior year was 8,059,759. So if I just compare to last year first, you can see that you're up about $182,000 over the prior year. There's a couple of things in here. So if we look just at your tax line, you can see that your taxes this year are $5,244,051. Last year, they're $5,097,234. So you're up about $146,000. There's a couple of things in there, and I'm sure you've heard the story all year long. Your deed transfer tax um, turned out to be higher than the prior year and higher than your budget. It was an unusual year. Obviously, you probably budgeted low because COVID. Everybody thought that uh, nobody would be selling their houses and there wouldn't be a lot of deed transfer tax, but there actually turned out to be a lot of activity. Um, so you're over in your compared to your budget and you're over compared to your prior year and your deed transfer tax. But also you maintained your tax rate at the same amount as in the prior years. But each year, the assessments that come out of the Property Valuation Services uh, Corporation goes up a little bit. So your residential tax assessment base went up this year. So there is a, a bit of an increase in terms of your residential and commercial taxes as well. But also the contribution that you made for the school board or the Tri-County Regional Education Center, um, that contribution has gone up a bit as well, which reduces your revenues, uh, your tax revenue as well. So that's the story in your taxes. I'm only going to talk about the ones that are a little bit different. Um, so then if we looked at other revenue from own sources, you can see that last year was 1529000 This year is $1,402,000, which is still higher than budget of $1,305,000. Um, so the drop from the prior year is mostly in your interest and penalties area, um, and you had budgeted for that. You expected it to be a bit lower, and it, and it was a bit lower than the prior year. But there also were a couple of extra things in last year's revenue items um, included in that category that you wouldn't have had this year. So some of the things were unsightly premises. Um, you did have some money came over from your tax sales surplus account as well. Um, so that would have come over in the prior year. So that one was only down 127000 so the next one that's a rather large change is the conditional transfer from federal and provincial governments. You can see that you originally budgeted 2,547,000. You came in at 845,000 and last year was 718,000. So the big change between your budget and your actual was all to do with projects. So you had planned to do a big project um, with one of your sewers, uh, which didn't end up happening as well. You were gonna use more of your gas tax money towards a couple of projects as well. So you had budgeted, you know, basically 1.7 million more than your actual turned out to be. Um, and it is a little bit higher um, this year because you did more use more of your gas tax money uh, during the year. And you're going to see that in the expenses as well, because you used your gas tax money um, partially towards your funding of the ferry terminal uh, upgrades that were happening. So that's the biggest change from, from your budget to your actual in that one line. Um, and then you can see in the interest line, which is the very last one, your budget was low, 134,960. You came in at 226,000 and last year was 233. So from an actual to actual perspective, it is, is quite close, um, but your budget was low because you expected your interest revenue to be lower than it actually was. So in total, you are up $182,000 more than the prior year in your revenue. On the expenditure side, you're actually very close as well. You had budgeted 7,894,606, came in at 7,728,805, and last year was 7,529,546. So you're only up in terms of total expenses by 199,000, and you're actually lower than your budget by 165,000. And so really, that's not a very big change on a $7 million budget. Um, and so you'll see there are some things that are up and some things that are down. 
So your general government services are up. It was your year of your election. Um, so there were additional costs associated uh, with the election, but you're right on your budget. So you knew how much you were gonna spend. You're also up in protective services. So your RCMP contract each year, there's a small increase. Um, again, that one's right on, you know, pretty close to your budget. So you knew what it was gonna be. Um, and then the transportation services, uh, the spend is 838,000 this year versus the 561 last year. And that's because of your contribution to the ferry terminal for the $300,000. And it's a little bit higher than your budget because your budget was for only 200,000 to go towards the ferry terminal. Um, and then environmental health services, not a big change, but last year it is a smaller uh, spend in the current year than last year. And that's because last year had more repairs than the current year. And then the next couple of categories are, are quite similar. And the very last one is recreation and cultural services. You can see last year was 712,000, this year's five, uh, 556,000, which is even lower than your budget. And you had budgeted for lower because you realized that some of the programs that were being offered wouldn't be able to be offered because of COVID. And so that's the bulk of the reasoning behind that. So what that does um, in terms of your annual surplus for the year before other unusual items, your 513,362 versus last year's 530,213. So only $20,000 less than the prior year. So very really consistent, although there's ups and downs, your net result turned out to be very consistent. And then you had a small gain on disposal of tangible capital assets. So you sold some land and disposed of your mobile building. So at the end of the day, your annual surplus is 542,370 versus the 530,000 of 213 uh, of the prior year. So a little bit better than the prior year. And in actual fact, in your budget, if we backed out that additional 1.7 million that you planned on spending on capital, your budget would have been about 300,000. So you're still better than your budget um, on a planned basis. And that budget can, uh, contains the subsidiaries budgets as well. That's not just the municipalities, that's your proportionate share of those as well. So you actually are, are very good in comparison to your budget. Your accumulated surplus at the beginning of the year was $21,262,242. We add in that surplus. And at the end of the year, you have an accumulated surplus of 21,804,612. And when we flip the page over to the next page, that 21,804 ties right into the very last number on the next page as well. They have to tie together. This is your statement of financial position. So basically your balance sheet. These are your assets and your liabilities. Um, and so for public sector accounting standards, we our presentation is a little bit different than what you might see in a normal operation. They pull out your financial assets and put them at the top of the page and they leave your, your non financial assets at the bottom, because your non-financial assets are your infrastructure, your investment in your community, and those items are not available to sell, to generate cash, to pay off your liabilities. So they're always left at the very bottom of the page so that we can clearly look at the health of your organization based on your actual financial assets. And so you can see in your financial assets, the total this year is 10,587,171. Last year it was 10,285,927. So you have grown over the prior year by $300,000 um, and um, about 150,000. So about half of that is sitting right in cash. Your cash balances have grown over the prior year. Most of the other ones are fairly close. Your tax receivables in a very good position. I'm sure there was a bit of concern, you know, last year this time or how are collections gonna go in, in our COVID world, but they actually improved over the prior year. So your staff have done a really good job in terms of collections. Um, and that keeps you in really good stead when we look at your financial indicators. One of the tests is, you know, what is your receive, tax receivable balance at, at the end as a percentage of your levy? And you are on the very low end of that, that percentage. So that will keep you in a healthy uh, house, I guess we'll call it. And so the only one that really changed elsewise from the prior year is your water supply upgrade lending program. So last year, as you'll recall, was very, very dry. So there was a big uptake in this lending program. So it's good. You had the money available um, to your residents to be able to offer to them. So this year, it's 342892 whereas last year, it was only 129852 So that's a great program to have uh, to be able to offer to your residents. On the liability side, fewer categories, uh, but in total 4,800,497 versus last year's 2,899,728. Um, and you can see the biggest increase this year is in your long-term debt. 
1,762,184 versus the 249,456. And so that was the um, COVID loan that you guys got for $1.6 million that was offered, you know, early on in COVID to make sure that, you know, the municipalities were having enough cash to be able to withstand if people couldn't pay their taxes. And so you took advantage of that loan has a short uh, payback period. So um, you didn't actually end up using a lot of it, uh, but it did help you in the period of time where you're constructing your, your new building, uh, but you will be able to pay that back um, in the required timeline. Um, you can see payables and accruals are up a little bit over the prior year. So you are still in the, the final stages of construction of the new building at the end of the year. So there were some payables in there regarding the project, as well as the final payment on the ferry terminal. So 100,000 in there was for the ferry terminal as well. The item that we call deferred revenue. So that's cash that you've been advanced that you're gonna spend on future projects. It's $1.6 million. So the bulk of that is your gas tax money, about 1.3 million of gas tax. So that's earmarked for future capital projects. Um, and so that's the way it is. We defer it until you spend it and then it comes into revenue. And the other piece that's in there this year too is your safe restart funding, which is also uh, a grant that you got as a result of COVID. Um, you got about 240,000 and you spent about 120. So you have about 120 left to spend in the current fiscal period too. So that's one of the reasons, uh, or one of the items that's remaining in that deferred revenue balance. So then we take your financial assets and remove your financial liabilities and you get your net financial asset position of 5,786,674. Uh, and so you can see that is lower than the prior year. 7,386,199. So it's dropped to about $1.6 million. And any year where you're going to spend a significant amount of capital, that's when you're going to see this number come down. So basically, that's your investment in your new uh, building, the spend related to that, because the asset is below the line, but the debt and the use of your cash is above the line. Still a very strong position to be in, almost $6 million in a, in a net asset position. Um, and significantly higher than the debt, the long-term debt that you have in the future. The other thing to note is I talked a little bit about your subsidiaries. They do contribute um, to your revenues and expenses on the prior page, but the bulk of it is mostly the municipality of Argyles. But of this 5,786,000, they have contributed 957,000 positive to your net financial asset position. So they all each have a, you know, a fairly strong position for, for smaller entities as well. So then the bottom half are the non-financial assets. So these are your tangible capital assets. This is the, um, the investment you've made in your infrastructure in your community. The original spend was 26,163,254. That's the original cost. It's not fair market value, but it's what you've paid. And according to accounting standards, you have to amortize that because those assets age over time. And at some point in time, you're gonna to have to replace them. So we've taken amortization of 10,172,339. So the net book value is 15,990,915. And so there was an additions of capital assets this year by $2.9 million. Uh, 2.8 million comes directly from the municipality itself of which 2.4 million was the new building. So that was the bulk of the, um, of the additions in the capital assets this year. Then you just have a small amount of prepaid expenses. Again, we come back to your accumulated surplus, um, which uh, 21 million, uh, you can see very clearly that 16 million of that 21 is invested in your infrastructure. The rest is basically money that you've got set aside for future expansion in your, in your infrastructure, which will come, um, come about. So those are the two most important pages. Um, I'll just touch briefly on page six which is the continuity of that net asset position that we looked at on your balance sheet. So this just shows how in years where you spend a significant amount on your capital assets. Um, so you can see you had actually budgeted to spend 4.9 million, but you only ended up spending 2.9, which was basically uh, the substantially the building itself. In those years that you're gonna spend uh, a large amount of capital assets, this number is gonna come down because you can see that last year where you still grew your net asset position and you spent a million, but this year you spent almost 3 million. So that's gonna be the year. So you actually drew down your financial assets by $1,599,000.
Um, but you had spent time, you had council had made decisions over the past number of years to set aside money because you knew you wanted to build this new facility. So you had been saving towards it. So that was what was in this net financial asset position was the money that you had put aside for, for the build. Okay, so page seven is the statement of cash flows. Um, and so this uh, just shows the change from last year's cash balance which was 8,706,000 to 8,863. So you grew by $157,000. Um, and so you can see that it basically starts with your surplus during the year. And then we add back your amortization because that's a non-cash item. And then the rest of the changes are when you collect your receivables, when you pay your payables, when you buy capital assets, when you pay off your long-term debt, all those items cause your cash to go up and to go down. Again, you grew your cash balance by $157,000. So the rest are the supporting notes and disclosures. Um, I've gone through them with your audit committee, so I'm not gonna go through them here tonight, but I will just say that there weren't any new accounting pronouncements that came out during the year that significantly impacted your audited financial statements. Also, there weren't any significant changes in your own internal processes um, that your management uses to produce these financial statements. Um, so they will look very similar to the prior year as the notes will look very similar uh, to the prior year as well. Were there any particular notes on them that you thought maybe that we should go over or is that good? Well, I, I don't think so. I, I, okay. I think the, the audit committee would certainly need to have yep. that opportunity. Yeah, we had a very good, good meeting yesterday. Uh, lots of discussion around the financial results. So yeah, there was lots of questions asked. So yeah, okay. So that's my presentation. If anybody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Yes, go ahead, uh, Councillor. Uh, Gloria, any uh, any huge adjustments that you've had to do at the end of the year causes concern? No, uh, we did post two small journal entries. One was two thousand, and one was seven thousand. We presented to the audit committee yesterday, and they were uh, very immaterial. We just did them to make sure that the financial statements would balance. Um, and then, of course, we do the pickup of the subsidiaries, which is kind of a journal entry. But, but note, there was nothing that caused us any concern from the journal entries this year. Thank you. Anybody else? No, well, I guess looks like uh, satisfactory with the with the uh, results. Gloria, are you going to be sticking around until we, we vote on this, or do you go? Whichever you prefer, I will no, do. It's up I'm, to I'm... you. It's just that if you if, if you want it to be here, I know it's down the agenda, on the agenda, but uh, if it was okay with council, I could move, I could move to that item and vote on that now, and then go back to the regular agenda if it's okay, so that you don't have to okay. sit there and wait. You've been You've been patient enough with us tonight. <laughs> sure, excellent. So if it's okay with uh, with council, uh, I'll move on to, to for decision 11A, and that's the audited financial statements. And the, uh, um, the, the audit committee is recommending uh, approval of this. So if we can have a motion. Moved by Councillor Bork, seconded by Councillor Dontremont. Any questions on the motion? If not, I'll ask for the question. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Okay, so that way we won't let you sit there and, and I know, I know you're not bored, but. <laughs> no. no, very interesting presentations. I enjoyed them. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. Yeah. It's the okay. rest of our agenda that could be a little boring. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Gloria. Okay. Bye now. Okay. Good. So we'll go on to the regular uh, agenda again. Mr. Warden. First is the adoption of minutes, special council meeting of uh, August 3rd. And it's attached. Okay, moved by Councillor Surrett, seconded by Councillor Bork. Any any questions or 
Hearing none, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Counts, uh, business arising. I don't see anything business arising from the minutes. Nothing, oh, sorry. Yes, Councillor Councillor Bork first. I have a question uh, in the minutes. Um, the TIR, did we receive any correspondence back from them? We sent a letter, uh, we're had, supposed to have sent a letter uh, asking about brush cutting and signage. Did we receive anything? I, I didn't see anything. Yeah, it's just we did, we did it. not. Okay. We did not receive. The, I, I, I'm pretty sure Ailey can confirm that, that that letter has been signed and sent. I believe the warden. I, yeah, letter, they did sign that. But we have not received a response. I'll just make a note that our, in my district, the sides of the roads haven't been mowed yet this summer. They're, we're, they're, we're they're in the area. So. Well, they're in this area mowing now, so I don't know if yeah. they're heading. It's back. almost too late to come. The grass is dying. So. Yeah. Councillor Dickton, you had your hand up. Kathy, oh, sorry, and I was Ailey, did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to state that um, we did send the letter out some time ago, but we didn't receive anything back from TIR. Right. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, Councillor Digden. Councillor Bork and I was heading in the same direction. Thank you. Okay, good. So the next is councillor's report. Any councillor have any report? Councillor Albright. Thank you, Warden. Um, just wanted to quickly mention for the Mariner Center Expansion Committee, we met a few times throughout the summer just kind of as an FY, just to kind of give you a quick update, uh, we, we submitted the application. We haven't heard anything yet. It's kind of in limbo now because of elections and potential government changes. So we're, we're kind of sitting on that and waiting. However, while we're sitting on, on the application and waiting to see what we're going to hear, we are taking steps to move forward um, so that we are ready in case the application, or not, let's not say in case, but for when the application is approved. Um, we're ready, we're, we're moving forward in, in making sure that we're ready, we're ready to move forward as well. And the fundraising RFP is being worked on um, and that will soon be launched so that we can get that moving. Um, recreation wise, uh, it was in the staff report, but I guess the big project that has been ongoing and uh, is the Glenwood Park upgrades. So that's been stalled a little bit because of, of some archeological archeo issues, but uh, we're, we're just waiting on a few more recommendations and it probably, the volleyball court probably won't happen this summer, but it's, it's still on the table and we're still gonna try to push that forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Councillor Digden, I think you had your hand up, yes. Uh, I did, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I know some people may think, will we take some time off in the summer as counselors, but I can assure each and every one of them and that, that although we may take a month off or so for our regular council meetings, there's always something going on and we are all attending meetings. So it's not as we we're taking a, a month without anything going on. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to mention. A thank you goes out to our senior safety officer, Peggy Woodrow that is working on a couple of cases with me and uh, very good to work with and getting a lot of a lot of uh, favorable comments for the work that she's doing on our behalf. And another one that I'd like to send out to is uh, our um, building inspector, John Sullivan, and our CAO uh, that have been working on securing the property in Middle West Pubnico, Civic Number 1057. A lot of concerned residents and the West Pubnico Fire Department is very concerned as it could be a very serious fire that has the potential to cause a lot of damage if it was to burn that building. So uh, I seen today that there's three carpenters over there. Uh, they done quite a bit of work today securing that building. And if I could, I'd just like to ask our CAO just to explain what happens in a case like this, uh, where the letter has been sent to the owner. Uh, he did not uh, fulfill his requirements and that it became a municipal uh, issue. 
who's going to pay for it and where's the money going to come from and what we do to get it, try and get it collected. Thank you. Okay. Through you, Warden, um, just to answer that as quickly as possible, because I know other, other councillors want to give the report as well, is the, um, that the costs associated with repair um, are, are initially, if, if the municipality is, is forced to, to make that change on, on property, that property or any property, um, typically we give the opportunity first for the residents or the, the owner to, to, to deal with it themselves. Uh, outside of that, if we feel that something has to be done, we have the right to do that, and the cost would be billed to the owner of that property, whether it's a an unsightly fix or whether it's a, it's a demolition or some somewhere in between. So, so the, the funds are initially dispersed by us, but the homeowner or the property owner are are responsible and are billed. We do have a policy in place for for relief in certain unusual circumstances, none of those would apply to commercial business. Yeah. Okay. Can thank I you very much. Song, eh? hey, thank you, Warden. Um, I'd first like to report that the Comos Hill uh, Wharf project is complete and it's a very nice area with a beach alongside the wharf, it's, it's very nice. Second, I'd like to uh, say that I attended a, a the Boktush uh, Bay Oyster uh, session and I basically only went to uh, educate myself on the oysters and I was surprised to see how suitable our inlets and waterways are for oysters. I also didn't know how how these um, shellfish can can clear clean the water their their filters and to my surprise the other day watching a documentary in New York City they're actually using oysters to clean their harbors uh, which is a big deal over there. So uh, yeah, it's quite educational. And, and last, uh, the um, uh, brush uh, maybe has not been cut completely here, but they've mowed the shoulders and they definitely did a good job in the Dominic Road, which is out of my district, but uh, in Daniel Allen's district. And we had got together to make sure that was cleared because it was quite dangerous. Uh, anyhow, to, to Nicole's point she, last uh, meeting, she mentioned how people take pride in their community. And so in driving around these communities before this grass was, was cut, I noticed a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people were cutting, mowing the shoulders themselves. And I first appeared in different little villages and, and uh, they're doing a great job. And to my surprise, my, my hometown village of Abrams River, uh, Danny's, Danny's town, I think they've mowed the entire road on both sides. It's, it's quite neat, it's quite nice. I, I want to caution people though that we, I'm sure we don't sanction that and that to be careful of, of, of the, all the flying rocks. But again, uh, uh, it, lo it looks nice for the people to be willing to take that on themselves. And I thank them for doing that. Thank you. That is, that is something that ever since I've been here, people, who take their turns, they'll do, they'll do in front of their house and go, if there's no house, they'll go to the next one. And people seem to, to, to take pride in, in having the shoulders mowed. But, but we can't go, it doesn't take care of all of the tall grass. We can't go to what they did with the, with the mower. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in there. Uh, Councilor Strat. Uh, yes, I uh, can mention that uh, I'm meeting with the Industrial Commission. Uh, we're working on the, uh, uh, the uh, having a plan to run the wharf in Yarmouth. And we're working hard on, on that plan. It's almost all done. In the next couple of months, hopefully that'll be settled. There'll be somebody, a group running uh, the wharf in, 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 the, in the town of Yarmouth. The airport corporation, of course, we had our meeting. We have three new members. I know I'll, uh, I mean, might be cutting into your stuff, but uh, we had three. We, we've uh, appointed three, three, vol uh, three members of the community to be on, on the board along with the other councillors. So that's, uh, that's great. Uh, also, I'd like to say that uh, uh, to Nicole's point on the Mariner Center, the Mariners on Maine, will be opening sometimes in October, could, could, could be the 12th, somewhere around that 
that time. So that's that's good, as Rebecca was saying. A lot of the doctors recruiting uh, are looking for places like that. Last but not least, I'd like to mention August the 15th. Uh, there was a mass on District 4 this year, the mass for uh, the Acadians, uh, that we call it the Acadian mass. And we celebrated here at Albany, uh, the daughter more retiring. Great turnout, COVID restrictions uh, for, uh, I guess, couldn't get as many as we would have liked. And uh, we had a tatama, making some noise at a parade from uh, Surrettes Island right to uh, Hubbers Point in Danny's district. And uh, we woke up uh, everybody in Hubbers Point. <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> That's it. Anybody else? Count Okay, Councillor Dottramont first. Thank you, Warden. I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, remind everybody that the uh, 55 plus games are happening in Yarmouth. Uh, the grand opening is uh, on Thursday at 5.30 at the Mariner Center. So there's somewhere around 700 uh, people involved from all over the province. So it'd be a great uh, weekend of uh, all kinds of activities. So. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Boudreaux. Press the wrong button now. I'd like to touch on a few things that Glenn, uh, Councillor Digden uh, mentioned. Uh, shout out to Peggy Boudreaux. Uh, she's, done, she's doing an excellent job. Uh, I'm also dealing with a resident here in Wedgeport that needs assistance. So uh, she's helping me out and she's doing a great job. Also, as he mentioned, uh, attending meetings, all, not all summer long, but uh, quite a few meetings this summer. And I'd like to thank, uh, on behalf of the uh, Wedgeport Tuna Tournament, uh, TIR for cutting the uh, grass on the side of the roads uh, before the tournament. Uh, so the uh, community uh, looked, looked a lot better than it did prior to. And uh, now all we need is uh, for them to get the uh, signage and the uh, brush cut. Hopefully that will come soon. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Bork. Thank you, Warden. Um, I, I also attended a, quite a few meetings this summer. Uh, then uh, I attended the police advisory committee and we had a report uh, from Michelle Arcois of what they're doing. So um, there's a lot of staff that was um, on, uh, on sick leave and things like that. So they were short, but I think they're starting to get back on track. So they're supposed to do us a report to present to all the municipalities coming as it was in uh, Peggy Boudreaux's uh, report. And um, coming, um, we have an East Pamico Improvement committee and they are working on a sign for East Pamico. So we'll have one at both ends because we have an entrance, both ends of our community. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have two signs coming up. And, and thank you to this group. Thank you. Okay. I think that was everybody. My report is, uh, is uh, uh, attached. Um, going to the signs, that seems to be taking right off. Uh, I know, I know, I think Councillor or, or Deputy Warden Albright, they're working for Belleville. I know there's a group working for uh, Eelbrook and St. Andrews. Oh, and, and now I hear East Bamnico. So it's good that it, that, that it has taken off. And uh, I know some businesses are, are, are even contributing to, to, to some of those, you know, when they ask. So it's very, very good. Uh, as far as uh, Tatamar, we, we, we did the same thing and we, we went from lower, from Glenwood or Laurel Brook, I guess, all the way to, through Tusket. So we, we picked up kind of where you left off uh, from Surrey's Island and we went around Tusket and Belleville. And I know Wedgeport had one, uh, Pubnico had one as well. Yes. So I think it was, it, it was good. It, it, it took off. So my report is there. I attended quite a few meetings. Uh, even though we have summer off, we, we don't really have summer off. We, we just, we're just not scheduled. And we, we, 
we look after the business as as it comes. So, even and and as uh, Councillor Digden said, just because we take a, a, a summer break from a regular schedule doesn't mean that we're not dealing with the with the issues and 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 we've had a couple of special meetings through the summer. So so that uh, just so that the public knows that we just don't. We just don't hang our hats and, and not do anything in the summer. We're, we're still busy. And this summer seems to have been fairly busy for me. I don't know what everybody else, but it seems to have been very, very busy. So, okay, we'll move on to staff report and I'll turn that over to our CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna really breeze through this. There's been a lot of information shared today. So we've had the opportunity to read this in advance. So I'll really go through very fast and, and maybe spend time answering questions. Um, uh, so just on the building itself, we're still, uh, as you might have noticed, some of the things are on the wall that weren't there the last time we had a meeting uh, in this particular office. It's, it's uh, no different in other offices as well. We still do have major things that need to be finished. Uh, one is um, we have paving on the second layer, the second layer of paving and an extension of paving on the J.E. Hatfield Court. That will be completed in coordination with the new construction that's happening in behind. It just made sense to, to coordinate that at the same time when they have paving for parking. Uh, the same company is doing both. So uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, noise reduction for uh, major air, four major areas, one of which has, has been, uh, we have installed uh, sound panels in one of the two boardrooms. It has made a significant difference. So we're gonna do the same in the other boardroom and um, We'll have a different solution for the boardroom, sorry, the uh, council chamber and also the uh, the main entry. We'll, we'll have to have a different uh, solution because of the cosmetic, uh, for cosmetic reasons. The audio visual installation was kind of disappointing. Um, we're still, it's in the short, short answer is it's still incomplete. There's some things that are missing, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're meeting like this. Uh, we need to make sure that our audio visual and our cameras are working and the sound is working properly in order to properly convey the message and be transparent to our, our residents. And, you know, artwork, plants and other things like that. There's always, you know, a, a, a about 85 small things. And uh, I, I was hopeful that we would get uh, through 84 of them by now, but uh, there's still quite a few of them still to go. And it's like anything else when you when you build a house when you build your own home uh, you're still kind of thinking oh shoot I should have done that should have done this luckily uh, we're still within our budget so um, any sort of major changes you would be aware of and so seeing as I haven't been sending you some major changes uh, you should know that the that it's all you know fairly minor um, you know we're well within you know um, uh, my my and other department heads authority to purchase within the budget. In terms of um, strategic priority sessions, we will be turning our attention to that now that we we uh, are starting to put some of this uh, construction and move behind us. Uh, COVID is still around us. While we might be tired of COVID, COVID is not tired of us. So um, we still have some you know issues with that. Uh, mandatory masks are going to come off, and and we need to be clear uh, that the health and safety of our of our staff is, is established and we're still learning what the province means by some of the things that they've said and they had a briefing today which I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to hear but we we uh, you know we will be establishing some um, uh, uh, so, some, um, some some testing kits here so we can get them free from the province of Nova Scotia it's a self-test so we'll be having that here in order to um, you know, perhaps you know further protect the staff if there's any concerns about possible exposure and so on. Um, very quickly, fishing dispute where we remain focused on that communication. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, activity happening in, in Cape St. Mary's and and there had been some protests, etc. Um, so uh, DFO is, is is you know enforcing where they can and and uh, I don't really have I'm not. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to update on that end that you probably don't already know. Um, Mariner Center, uh, 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 I think most of that had been discussed already. We do have a meeting this uh, Thursday, the 15th, which is tomorrow. Um, we have a, a meeting uh, in which uh, Nicole is the chair. 
the airport corporation um, just just a couple of operational things. The board approved price increases for landing fees, and the um, I had to be on site for a section of the day on the eighth to accompany some of the staff on site for a an audit of the safety rating neighbor policies. The uh, the airport is uh, federally run in terms of policies. So many of our policies are provincial, but because this is a Transport Canada uh, airport, not owned, but, but uh, regulated, um, the federal uh, regulations apply. Uh, funding applications, oh, I mean, as you know, there's an election, so those are on hold. Uh, we'll wait and see if we're successful. We have other applications that are in the hopper that we're considering whether or not to apply. Based on your priorities, we have some pre-planning to do before we can bring it to council. Uh, in terms of bylaw complaints, as you know, last last uh, meeting um, I was appointed as as a temporarily a bylaw um, enforcement officer. I've received three complaints: two uh, dangerous or unsightly, and one noise. The noise was a multiple complaint, same location, and uh, was was dealt with by RCMP. And the two others are, are underway, one of which we did do some, some capital um, adjustments to, and the other will be writing to the, to the owner. And that, that probably is in Tuscan. There are still some that are on the outstanding list, and we hope to um, resurrect some of those that may have gone a little dormant um, to, to make sure that they get resolved. Uh, there's a whole lot, slew of other miscellaneous work. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to blast through it like there's some policy work that is has really been delayed due to, to just capacity issues. Uh, we have filled two positions. Uh, Morgan Churchill will start tomorrow uh, as our, our, our wastewater operator in West Pamico, uh, studying, I guess, next to Vaughn. And Kyle Boudreau has been here for three weeks, who, is, uh, who replaced Louis Boudreau in his position. And uh, he's off to a, a blazing start. Um, it's been a great addition to the team. Um, uh, so uh, we're working through a lot of, uh, of projects there. Um, we did attend a coastal protection uh, presentation. There, the, there's going to be act. There's going to be regulations added to restrict how how development occurs within 100 meters of a coast. Uh, that's for erosion purposes and for like rising tide, rising uh, sea level purposes. Um, essentially, the regulations are seeking to protect the public from from you know making a mistake around how close they develop to the sea line. There are some very specific regulations and exclusions uh, for for certain commercial properties that require to be right on the water. Like obviously, in certain in, in many of our communities, we see that with our fish processing plants. So they would be exempt, and and, uh, and this is for new construction, obviously, we, we, we apply to. So um, so we're still figuring out what that looks like, and we'll have something for you, the Committee of the Whole, perhaps to present to the province for them to consider in their, in their process. Um, uh, we, there, um, obviously, the audit is completed, so that was work that we've done to this point, and uh, there's SOT, uh, um, Policy registrations in order to put out fines is, is outstanding. That's with the uh, Department of Justice uh, for approval. Um, um, uh, I'd say the rest, I'll, I'll just say that the REMO uh, is doing the drought response plan, and that was approved at the recent REMO meeting. So there's a lot, a lot of different things going on, and uh, that was mostly my report. You will uh, you will see that every staff member has added their their bit, and um, I'd be happy to answer the questions that I can of theirs or of my own. Any questions, Councillor Digden? Thank you. I was just wondering, uh, Mr. Alain Mules, we used to get a report from the building inspector as to how many building permits were issued and in what areas they were issued in. And it just gave a, a counselor or myself anyway an idea what was going on in my district and that. And I, we haven't had them in the past little while. I was just wondering if that's something that we could get going again, um, if it's something that's possible to do. Absolutely. We'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll make sure that that gets added to the committee of the whole. So we won't, we, we, we can put it to, on to the monthly uh, staff reports, but uh, 
seeing as it hasn't been shown in a while and seeing as it's fairly interesting information, we'd be happy to do that for you. Pretty easy to pull out of, out of the uh, software program that we use. Mm -hmm. I think we used to get an email from from someone that showed that that, that would be sent to the to counselors uh, when Tara was there or somebody some you know came from that for sure. Yeah, go ahead. And the only other thing, if I may, um, I'm looking at the finance department, Marsha Dion. I believe each time we have the accountant in. Uh, and what she says about the, the finances and that is a great reflection of what Marsha does and her staff on our behalf at the municipality. Thank you. Anybody else have questions for the report? Okay, hearing or seeing none. Thank you for the report. I don't believe we, no, we don't, we don't vote to accept the report on that. We just, it's just for information, I guess. So it brings us to number 11, which is for decision. We've already dealt with uh, the audit, uh, audit financial statements. The next one is expression of interest, uh, accessible housing discussion group. And this is a letter that was sent to me. Um, it comes from Digby. I, I, I do believe that the reason this is coming up is uh, every every district has like a housing committee. Ours is choice housing that I've been I've been on I think since I since 2012. And since COVID, what what was happening is it was taken over by by uh, um, it was taken over the committee was taken over by by not shift but women's center. I think anyway, and we were including Yarmouth and Digby and Shelburne. Okay, and we were meeting. We we're meeting online, and it's it got to the point where the person that was in charge of this was unable to. She she said she she was too busy. She didn't want it. She didn't want to be in charge of this committee, and it was getting harder and harder to get someone to take over. And I think basically what's happening now is I'm not sure that we're going to be having those meetings, but we felt it was felt that that we should not just drop the affordable housing portion of that for sure. And I think that's where this has come from from Digby that they're looking to see if if we can if we can get together. And and I'm surprised that that uh, it didn't include Shelburne because it just says Digby and and. and uh, well, kind of Digby Council. Well, Digby and Southwest Nova. So I guess maybe it does include children as well. And this would just be some meeting that would take place quarterly. And uh, I know I know we've had our development development officers that from different uh, that that were always uh, part of the these meetings. So whether they would still be. Uh, whether they would still be part of that or not, that would be something. But I'm just wondering if we're interested in, in forming that type of a, of a committee or a, of a group and be part of. And I think it's important because affordable housing is on our, uh, affordable housing is definitely on our, on our uh, priority list. So I'm not sure that I want to take another committee. <laughs> I'm just wondering if someone would want to sit on a committee such as that, and and because it's uh, because it's in three counties, it would definitely be a Zoom meeting. So so you don't have to travel. I don't believe you'd have to travel to to Shelburne or Digby to to attend meetings. So anyway, I think we need to first of all the thing is do we do we want to be part of this? And that would be something that uh, council would have to decide. So is there any comments or I think it's a great, I think it's something that we should be part of. There's no doubt. Councillor Surratt. I think it's a great idea and when you can pull everybody together. Maybe there's chances of getting more grants or money or whatever. I, I think it's a great idea. And certainly uh, uh, would, you know, would gladly say as a council that I'd vote to, to, to make a motion to be on that 
on that such such a committee. Okay, so that's a motion to be. I made that motion. Vote. Yes. Is there a seconder to that? Seconded by Deputy Warden. Uh, any discussion? Yes, Councillor Sonia. Thank you, Warden. So let me get this clear. We we have a committee in Argyll just for housing, correct? For housing? Well, that's for, for affordable housing. Accessibility, sorry. Accessibility. But this one here, I know it says accessibility, but but uh, accessible housing in Digby, and I and I'm I, I'm not sure that what they mean by accessible housing is that there's no housing. You know, like there's it, it's it's not accessible. I don't believe in the term of accessible is what it means. I think they're talking about there's just no no housing there to be had, right? Because they're talking here about affordable housing, and it says yeah. here on behalf of, or, uh, let me see, it says it's a discussion group on affordable housing, right? And I, I was kind of put back when I when I saw accessible, but I, I, I kind of knew that this was coming, and, and I knew that it was discussed that it would be to be a, a group discussion group to discuss affordable housing and the availability accessibility means to me that there's not accessible there's there's no housing there for anybody and that's where i think the accessible uh, uh word comes in, in into this letter here okay so any other discussion we have a motion on the floor yeah councillor digden uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I was both looking at that accessible and affordable. And right now, there is a shortage of both in that down, well, not only around here, it, you know, pretty well nationwide, there's a shortage of homes. And that um, I would be willing to sit on that committee if I could have, have an alternate. And because of uh, some of the other work I do um, and work that I don't know when I'm going to have to do, I can't always make the meetings. Uh, so if I had an alternate that would be willing to, to take up the slack for me uh, when I can't make it, I would definitely try. Okay. Well, first of all, I think what we got to do is deal with the, with the motion that we are willing to, to, to be part of this group. Until, until we know, I mean, this is what we're saying. Digby is okay, we're okay. We don't know if there's going to be even a group at this point unless all the other uh, municipalities in between, right? So, so at this point, at this point, if we can just tell uh, um, Mayor Cleveland that yes, we are interested, then I think, I think we'll hear more on this once they have, and then we'll have to appoint someone to sit on the committee. But, but that's good to know that at least uh, you, would be, you would be willing to sit on that committee with, a, with an alternate. And it's always good to have an alternate on, on any of the committees anyway. So. so at this point, I think what we need is to just uh, uh, let them know that yes, we are interested in, in taking part in this, in this uh, group. And it's- and no, it's no. No. Yeah, go sounds ahead. good. Sorry about jumping the gun. No, no. Well, I, I kind of said that anyway before when I started that we would be looking. I just I just jumped ahead <laughs> a little too soon. Question. Okay, question call. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded. Carried. So we will need we will just need to 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 let uh, uh, Digby know that we are interested in taking part in this group. And then when the time comes, we'll have to decide on, on who sits on there. Okay, thank you. The next one is the five-year capital investment. There's two attachments, a one-page and a, and a two-page uh, memo. Now that is something perhaps that I should turn over to our CAO to, to, to go over this. Thank you. Um, so the uh, the five year capital investment plan is is something we approve every year. Um, um, for some of you, this might be the first year you, you approve it. So um, just a, a there's a memo attached to the to the um, 
there's of the two attachments, one is a memo that clarifies how um, how this particular information was collected and put together. So not all projects that you might feel are of priority are on this list right now. And one of the reasons for that is that if I have no information around the cost or even the magnitude or even when it's going to happen, I'm not going to include it until I have that information. So not all of the projects that we may have spoken about are on this list. Those that are on this list are things that we may have costed or that we have costed or are actually in the middle of doing and, uh, and that we know um, how much we're going to be spending this year and next and, and into the future. Or they are things like the Mariner Center expansion, where we've established a top line budget and we know what the percentage of, of participation is on our end. And we are, but, and then, and we do our best guess to understand what kind of federal provincial funding we might get, even if that funding isn't confirmed. So what I do is, is I show the project as something that if we get the funding, this is going to be a cost for you. And this is what it looks like. But because we're, you know, it's a major commitment that we've been obviously been quite, you know, that is a priority of council. Um, it, it makes sense to add it here, even if we don't have the funding. And of course, if we don't get the funding, we don't do the project. So that, that's the other thing. So, um, so uh, I guess what I would do is, first of all, let council know that this five year plan gets approved every year. And the first year matches your capital budget that you approve. So it may not even look like at this point, there are some projects we already know will be delayed into next year, but I didn't want for the first year capital investment plan to look like anything other than your budget. So that will match your budget. Um, and so uh, if I then look at the um, attachments, um, if there's a one page attachment, with a lot of numbers and um, I, I wanna just describe for a moment, um, how this came about. Most of the projects, as you see, are in 21-22. They're not all gonna be achieved in 21-22, most of which will spill into the next year. Um, but, the, and, and some of them are still not known exactly when they will happen. So, um, so there's a list of about 22, 23 projects there. And some of them are small and some of them are large. Um, you know, the admin building, well, we know that that's, that's completed or essentially, you know, the bill, not all the bills are paid, but it's done. So no sense really talking too much about that one. The Wedgeport septic we know will likely be delayed into next year, but some of it will happen this year, uh, especially in the planning side of things. The East Pubnico well retrofit is happening now. Uh, we expect to be completed by the end of this month. Uh, the uh, uh, dewatering, we know that that project is, is, is done. Uh, for West Pubnico, Comfit Solar, it says Wedgeport, should say East Pubnico because the location changed, but the, um, that is expected to happen this year as well. Um, JA Highfield Court, that's the paving. We, we, we can confirm that that will happen. Uh, and then what you'll see is it, it gets a little bit more convoluted as we look at the other projects. So Argyle Trails, for instance, is $50,000 every year. So we committed kind of to put $50,000 of gas tax aside for trail retrofits. Um, right now we're on hold because we put an application in with ACOA and you don't spend the money before you get the money. Um, so if we're successful with ACOA, we'll go ahead and do that work. If not, we'll probably go ahead and do that work, uh, but we will do much less. And um, so it's, it's just to make sure we don't like pile up a bunch of, you know, uh, of work all in one year. Uh, the the uh, sewer retrofits for Tuscan are, are essentially ongoing. Uh, fire ponds, retro and safety, that's a project that we're going to pick up again. We have done some work here and TIR has actually done quite a bit of it for us by, by doing some safety guards, et cetera. Uh, so that didn't actually cost us any money. Um, that one was delayed. We had to reconsider because of the private ownership issue. Some of these uh, fire ponds are private ownership and really um, to... To, to and, and some of them were really quite frankly not interested in having them continue as fire ponds. So we're really focusing in on the ones that are owned and operated uh, by fire departments or on public property. And I know that Lake Vaughan is actively seeking some work on theirs and they're likely gonna ask us to help them, which is for us great because it's the same as us. It's, it's actually like if they want, led by fire departments is always better because they know which ones they use and which ones they're, that they're mostly concerned with. 
Uh, rural internet will be done in two years in terms of payment. Um, so you'll see that. And the big ones that we, they are unpredictable that, that we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. One is a track and field upgrade. That's a $2.1 million project. We've committed to not go forward unless we got funding from the federal government of at least 50%. Um, uh, and so that's why what, when, we, when we show that project, we show that the money is coming from both uh, our partners in Yarmouth as well as the federal government. So our portion of a $2.1 million project is only $350,000. So if ever anybody asks you what the value is of intermunicipal partnership, that's an example right there. Um, now, I mean, you know, we got a big project in the town in located in the town that's quite large as well that wouldn't happen if you didn't have three partners, quite frankly, at least not to the magnitude that we're predicting. Um, and so, so the other projects on the list very quickly, Camos Hill Water has been completed. Asset management plan is likely going to happen next year, not this. Yieldbrook Fire um, and GSAR will likely happen, at least the GSAR has happened. $22,000 contribution has been uh, submitted to GSAR for the roof work. They did not get provincial funding, so they won't do as much as they predicted, um, but they'll probably apply again for funding next year. Hopefully they'll have better luck. Um, the Eelbrook Fire contribution, I'm predicting a $100,000 contribution in this year. Um, uh, that may be delayed depending on the project. Um, and finally, West Pumnico Library and Hipson Bridge retrofit. So Hipson Bridge retrofit could happen a lot faster if we get a COA funding that will expedite that work and put it ahead of the game. Um, but we know it's a, it's a fairly large project and there are limited uh, sources of funding, which, which is, you know, we, we like to be able to get somebody else to pay for these things. So sometimes, sometimes you know, a little patience goes a long way. And finally, the, um, the, uh, the West Pumnico Library project, uh, I'm showing $50,000 a year for the last two years of the, of the plan. And that's essentially it, what it reflects is, is the cost of, of engineering and all the other soft costs that you might get into uh, before you get into some, some heavy funding uh, of a project. So, you know, these projects of this magnitude, you're, you're typically putting a lot of, of, of like planning costs ahead of the actual construction. So that's very speculative, but I wanted to show it here as a project that, that is on your list, but unsure what it looks like. So recognizing that there's a lot of number talk today, um, and I know that you've looked at this, uh, essentially uh, what you'll see is the funding sources um, that show where the money is coming from on these projects. And the other thing is, is I make an assumption, I've made, excuse me, I've made the assumption that the federal gas tax money will be the same as it typically is, so I can, I can confirm that there's enough um, funds in the gas tax to pay for the gas tax eligible uh, projects, but we've also seen governments double the gas tax amount, so that'll only make things better. So I'll stop there, and if there's any questions or concerns or things that you might see that, or may not see that maybe you feel like should be there, um, obviously, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear any of that. Questions, anybody? Councillor Surratt. Uh, yes, I'll add on the, uh, if you're on your top line, you have administrative, administrative building. So if I go, if we go across to the next, right across where it says capital reserve gas tax, that federal, provincial. I see on the administration building capital reserve, 2.689 million, that's in brackets. Could you tell me why that is in brackets? And they said these public tank repair is not in brackets. The fire ponds retrofit is not in brackets. Yes, uh, there's a very good reason. Thank you for the question. So when the debt comes in in the current year, the money is gonna replenish the money you spent. So your capital reserve will get approximately 2.7 million injected in its reserve, which is why it's a negative. So that, so if you get the line, if you go all the way across way at the very end, you'll see that the total number is 1.1625. So what we're saying is, is yes, we're, we're gonna be spending 1.1625, but we're gonna get debt proceeds of 3.1 and we're gonna get a grant of 452 
and we're going to get gas tax to 300. So when we apply all those things, there's going to be money injected in the reserve. So, and, the, and, and the simple explanation for that is that you already spent it the year prior. Thank you. Great. That answers it. Perfect. Okay. Any, any other questions? Councillor Digden. Thank you. Uh, seems like I talk a lot, but anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, just wondering, and, and I don't even know if it's supposed to be here, uh, CAO or what or where it's supposed to be. Just wondering if we're going to go ahead this year with the, we were calling it the red cap well. Uh, there were some problems around there with the sewer and that, and it was on possibly for this year to get fixed. I was just wondering if, if that was going to be a capital project or not. Um, thank you for the question. Under West Pamniko dewatering slash sensors, that project budget is included in there. Okay. So description just doesn't, is not as inclusive as it could be, uh, but it is, I can assure you the project is budgeted there. I can give you an update on that. Uh, environment has to approve the plan that the engineers developed uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a measure for the overflow. And uh, so we have not received that approval and we cannot go forward with anything without it. And there's a chance that they won't approve it because the solution involves a, uh, a, a, a temporary direct uh, flow into the ocean. It would be treated um, but, um, you know, environment has to assure itself that it's in compliance with the law. Um, it would definitely be an improvement to the current situation. So that's our argument. Thank you very much. Councillor um, Surratt. You know, I should have asked this second question. Uh, I, I, I don't see anything in sidewalks there. And I know I've been questioned on it. So people listening, maybe you could explain, you know, why that is not on there. Yeah, so uh, as I explained in the description of the context, I, I don't actually have uh, A, a sidewalk on the docket yet, or B, the cost associated with that sidewalk yet. So it doesn't mean that it isn't the priority of council to build a sidewalk. What it means is that at this time, I don't have enough direction or costing information from council in order to put it on the list. And I would say again that next year at this time, you might be in a different situation and this may have a sidewalk in, it, in the plan. Um, um, so, and I know that the first part of that involved a sidewalk policy or, or a sidewalk uh, uh, document that, that would support how we actually deal with sidewalk additions in our community. Um, that work, just as a quick update, uh, is likely to be assigned at least partially to our planner because um, the policies that we looked at uh, across the province really deal more with maintenance and not with that kind of decision-making. So it really should be aligned with your active transportation plan so what we'll be doing is, is providing a recommendation to council associated with that. And uh, you know, we, we have learned that the active transportation plan is a very important document. And we had flirted with the idea that it ought to be modified to include at least one community that felt like they were not included. Um, I would suggest that that might be our course of action um, because, of the, uh, because of what the funding uh, models want. So one of the, the learning opportunities we had with a recent announcement in the town is that if, if, if you have a strong active transportation policy that's, that's costed, your probability of getting funded goes up substantially from some of these uh, federal funding uh, organizations. So um, that's a long answer to your question, but I, I, I hope that the, the residents understand it's not that it isn't a priority of of council, it is not your current priority, um, but I'm anticipating it might be uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, councillor. Okay, I see councillor Sonia and councillor Council Sonia. 
Thank you, Warden. Uh, just to follow up to Councillor uh, Surratt's uh, question on sidewalks, would uh, in in that study or in that uh, policy making, would you consider, or you probably would have to consider different sidewalk models in pricing, right? Because all uh, some some are definitely more expensive than others. Uh, am I correct? You would be correct. So any, I guess the, 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 whatever policy or active transportation plan or whatever, however we actually submit that, um, we'll be addressing a number of, of, of uh, questions. One is how does it get paid? Who pays for it? How does it get paid? So it's all gonna be in there. You know, whether there's federal funding or gas tax or area rates or whatever, this is how we're gonna fund these things. Um, this is the, the design that we're preferring. Uh, accessibility will be a priority. So we're, we're not going to be recommending dirt sidewalks because they are not in, accessible to many. So all of those factors will come in. Obviously, the need, safety, traffic, um, you know, all these uh, factors will come into play. And, and, and those factors may, may impact when you install those uh, sidewalks and where but it doesn't necessarily exclude the possibility of sidewalks in, in other locations that, that are, you know, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, weaker in, in, the, um, in the evaluation than others. Your, you do have an active transportation plan that will be a significant influence in, in where those additions happen uh, as well, which is why we wanna make sure that it represents what you'd like and what the community likes. And if there's an amendment that's required, there's a funding model out there to help us do that. Thank you. Councillor Bohr. Yeah, um, I guess uh, Councillor Sonia asked the same question I was gonna ask, but uh, while I have your attention, um, the West Pumico Library, um, I see that, that it's in year 24, 25, 25, 26, and $50,000 for those two, uh, years so that would what would that be for the, that amount would it be to relocate the, the, the library or because i don't know how long, much longer how the longevity longevity of the uh, library current library is is uh, is good <laughs> thank you for the question um a, I don't know that the years are entirely correct on that, first of all. Uh, B, the, the 50,000 each represents, it wouldn't represent a moving cost, it would, it would represent uh, the beginning of a, of a plan um, to, to construct new. I don't, I think that, you know, councils made the decision that, that the current location really isn't ideal and would like to consider new. And in that process, uh, which was led by Charlene, we had, we had uncovered that the most appropriate location was the Musée Acadien in West Pamnico. So the costs associated with those costs represent very, very loosely um, the work that we would uh, be hiring in order to, to, to plan that. It, it's all, in my mind, it's, not, it's probably not enough, but it's also very speculative. And yeah. We're going to spend a lot more than that, and but what we don't know is who is also going to help in the funding. So that's it's just it's it's early in the game. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question, Councillor Sonia. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I I should have asked you a minute ago, but I forgot. Um, there's been uh, quite. Uh, People asking me when the uh, grand opening is going to be, and I said, uh, "Well, COVID, COVID will let us know that for sure." And I also said there was a few glitches that had to be fixed. And so the question was, uh, 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 "It's going to cost us the municipality more money to fix these glitches?" And I said, "Well, uh, I, I said I, I, I really didn't know, but you told me today that the municipal uh, office or building is still under budget." Are you, uh, uh, after these glitches are fixed, will we still be within budget? Yes. Good, that's answer. good answer, thank you. And yes, it will cost us money to, to, to make these changes, but it's not unusual. 
um, it's not unusual to incur these costs. Um, uh, some of these costs are, we're actually just trying to, to fix cost savings that we have put in initially in some of the design. So, you know, to try to keep the cost down, we had we made design decisions. And then when you get to the end, you realize you, you hope that you made the right decision. And then you start moving in the building and you're like, well, I really think we need to address that. So, so you saved money by not doing it initially, but, but then you are spending, you're doing change orders to spend a little bit on, on the end. But yeah, it's not unusual, but we're still within budget for sure. Good. Okay. Any more questions? So what do we need on this? Do we need a motion to, to accept this? We need a motion to accept this, this plan. Yeah, so I can submit it to the province. Right, so. I'd like to make a motion to accept this plan. Okay, to move, seconder, seconded by Councillor Sonia. Any discussion or any more questions? Hearing none, I want to ask for the question. All in favor signify raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. The next one, it's a mosquito problem and this is district four. So I guess I'm gonna turn this over to district four, which is Councillor Sret. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, like last year, the mosquito situation in district four is just awful. Going from your home to your vehicle, you have to run or get bit by about a thousand mosquitoes. And when you're in your vehicle, you have to pound for about 20 minutes on your way to town to try to kill them. You can't barbecue unless you have a can of off by your side. You spray yourself. And if you miss one spot, I'll be dog gone. They'll be right on you on that particular spot. <laughs> pa patios, verandas, sitting in your lawn chairs. I guarantee you will not be there for more than 30 seconds. They'll just eat you alive. Quality of life for young and old has been bad enough with this pandemic. We were left to stay in our villages and not go very, very far due to the restrictions by the Department of Health. With the mosquito situation in District 4, it was a double whammy. I would almost call, I would almost call it a nightmare with the mosquito situation. It is just totally ridiculous. The mosquitoes swarm you as soon as you go outside. At our rental, finally in August, we have people starting coming in to our, in, in, our little, in our little area, in our little rent. And what we get is we get reviews every, every time. So for the last six weeks, finally people have been coming in. And here's what they have to say on the review. Beautiful rental property, Beautiful area, very friendly people, and very friendly bugs. We recommend you not to venture out of the homestead. I would like to propose to council that we send a letter to Colton LeBlanc, our MLA, and ask that he uh, th that his government does a pilot project for District 4 for the next five years. The same kind positively as in the greater mountain area where they do uh, uh, some kind of a environmentally uh, friendly spray is done by the higher students and they have some of the staff working on uh, on that issue also. All, all of this is done with the consultation of biologists. In terms of how this would be done would have uh, would have to have public consent first, consent first by way of a public meeting. And I would suggest at the Twin Village Social Club. Uh, we know that communications is a key for anything to be passed. And uh, let's say is if you spray or if you did anything, certainly you want the public consultation involved. I think it is time for action. The last two, year, two summers, the mosquito situation has been really bad and this is the, the most phone calls I've had in my 13 years as, as a counselor is the phone calls and especially this past summer on the mosquito situation. It is the worst. Resident, residents are just best. That's the plain word and I don't blame them. The saying in district four this year is, 
you kill one mosquito and not, not only Glenn Dignan comes with the funeral home, but the thousand mosquitoes come to the funeral. I think it's time for action. And I'd like something that uh, we could make a proposal to uh, contact Colton. And, and, and with the help of our economic development officer, Charlie, I'm not trying to push her on that. I'm just asking if that would be the person that could maybe follow this. And, and where Colton is on the side of government this time, he is a minister. Maybe we have a better chance to have, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, him represent us and come up with a proposal that would be acceptable to the residents as a pilot project. And I so made that proposal. I propose that. So your 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 motion is why? That go. Is that uh, our economic development officer, if it was okay with Alain, he's the, he's the boss. Oh, he would not be the one, Alain. Okay. Maybe I'll let Alain talk on this first. Well, I, I can't make a motion for you, but I think if, if I don't think it's appropriate for council to make a motion for, for anyone other than myself to do an action. And then I can determine what, from my end, what, what happens. But I, th I think you were talking about a letter. Um, and so perhaps not mentioning exactly who does the work, but rather the work that you have done might be more appropriate. Thank you, Al. I appreciate that. That gives me some guidance. So yes, if I would propose to, uh, uh, I guess, not to send the letter, to, to pass it on to our CAO, that he uh, or that staff uh, would uh, further this, would push this further and to see at our next meeting what we could do, or what could be done. Would that be okay, Alain? Would that sound all right? That we uh, ask staff to look into this and see what a uh, proposal could be to send to Colton. Would that be a, a proper uh, motion? Well, I, again, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put words in your motion's mouth. I, I, that, I, I think what I'm understanding that you're wanting is you want the province to take action on a pilot project. Yes. That's what you want. Then yes. perhaps the motion is, is, is that, is that we draft that such letter yes. to, to the, to the government and then see what happens. Um, and again, I, I, I really hate to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to, what you what you're you're saying and trying to help you along the motion. Thank you, Allah. You are helping me. Yes. So uh, I'll make a proposal that we send a letter to our MLA Colton LeBlanc, and that we ask him uh, to uh, take a look at what government could do to help the to, to, to help the situation with the mosquitoes in, in District Four or all of the municipality for that matter. Is that, is that muckled enough or is that clear enough? To, to <laughs> it's clear to me. We need a seconder if we're going to discuss the motion. If it's not, okay, it's seconded by Councillor Dotchbaum. Discussion on the motion. Councillor Sonier. I totally agree with you, uh, Councillor Surrett. Uh, how, however, as a, as a pilot project, I, I see the only thing I see coming forward, I see a lot of questions coming towards me because I just lived across the brook there from you and I get some of your mosquitoes and I think Abrams Observer and other places do too. Okay. So, so, uh, so the pilot project, uh, whether it's successful or not, the ramifications would flow into all the, the other communities such as Plymouth, such as Abrams Observer and such. So uh, uh, for that, for that, I'm all for it, you know, and, and uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, if it works, uh, it can spread to the rest of the uh, communities. Thank you. Wherever the pilot project would happen, exactly. Uh, anybody else? I. We we're waiting for we're waiting for for Dalhousie is going to have some kind of a program that they're coming to do a study. Yes. And I'm wondering if if it wouldn't be better to wait until we get that study of what uh, uh, what they determine what what they think is the problem or whatever. 
just just my thought because we are uh, you know it, through the municipality and through our develop, development officer she has uh, they have agreed to come and do a study on on the mosquito problem in this area i i, I can just add quickly to that warden they it's multidisciplinary that's what i know but i don't know exactly what they're going to do just yet that hasn't been determined that the to come in and do a study is confirmed and that it's going to be multidisciplinary uh, is also confirmed but but how they're going to go about it um, is yet to be determined so if if to the to the point of the motion the motion is asking the province to do something uh, i don't think you'd have to necessarily wait okay. for the results of that in order to move forward though you'd have to inform uh, the province that it is occurring. right okay just I was just wondering, you know, if we should. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Warden. Thank you. Um, I definitely, uh, Councillor Surrett, would support your motion because I think that by taking this step, we're we're really asking for a plan of action. I think we've thrown around this issue for a while now, and I don't live in your district, but I hear complaints from people even in your district. And every time I'm walking on the trail and I slap a mosquito or two, I think of you guys and think. You know, I can't imagine not being able to walk on my trail because of mosquitoes. So if it's if it's affecting, I, I, I loved what you had to say about the quality of life and COVID having, you know, really been tough and people were encouraged to go outside because of COVID, right? Because of isolation. And, and I know for myself, if I hadn't been able to go outside and it would have been, it would have been tough, right? So I would definitely support that. And, and hopefully we could get a plan of action to have something done for you the people in your in your district okay any about anybody else uh councillor threat uh just uh, then you were mentioning the uh, Dalla, that dalhousie was going to do some kind of a study uh if i if, if i recall it right they would be coming in october november is that when you become and the mosquitoes uh, they freaked out by then i know it ain't, it ain't gonna find too much. I come, this should come in, in mid-August. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think the intention is to do the study in October and like come in and like never come back. Uh, I think we'll make sure they understand when the high flight time of this stuff is happening. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I I can usually put my my off spray away in October. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments if not i'll ask yeah go ahead uh, i just i just want to be very clear not and this kind of happens to be about the topic of the motion but not necessarily motion specific like i just want to make sure that uh, that the council understands like our limitations around what we can do municipally from a scientific perspective like we are nowhere near able to deal with this so the fact that you're going to go to the province is 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 kind of a delight <laughs> in a way that it's that but but I will say that you know certainly from our perspective uh, we can put you know regular updates and newsletters you know maybe not in October but maybe in like May um, that talk about like some of the ways you can you can kind of like improve your life um, you know for instance the mosquito I live in District Four and I I you know and and uh, I uh, the positives is that uh, the mosquitoes can change my tires so uh, I don't have to bring my uh, vehicle to ultramire to get my tires rotated because they do it automatic um you know there's sometimes there's a puncture in it but but other than that it, it works pretty well so but then it's more and more serious no there are some things that we can do to educate like to have it like there's certain like kind of home remedies that work um i know i've tried some of my own um so we can do that part at the as a municipality may, you know look we may have you know, bat houses that we can build and, and partnerships to try to find some local solutions, but like a long-term solution of this nature, I just want to be very clear, like it's very difficult for us to do that. Yeah. Um, we sympathize, but we don't have the resources. So, okay. The province will. Yeah. If we, if we install bat houses, that'll take care of the mosquito problem because most of the people won't want to go outdoors because there's a bat lying around. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we have a motion on the floor. Oh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Dignan. Uh, thank you, just since, uh, since we're taking a light approach to some of this and making a few jokes, although it's no joke by no means, 
just okay. wondering, being as though my name and my profession was mentioned, I'm not in conflict to vote on this uh, this motion, am I? <laughs> okay, all jokes aside, I guess, <laughs> we can vote on this motion. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary-minded. Okay, so a letter will be drafted and sent to... All it, all it can do is they can throw it in the garbage or they can act on it. At least it's, it shows that we're, we're concerned. Uh, just to confirm the date, the Management Without Borders will be coming is September 24th. Okay. That's the date that they're, that they're meeting to plan a date before the end of the month. So that's coming from, from Charlotte. Okay. The next one is the correspondence, uh, Remo drought plan. I don't know if you've had a, it's just that uh, we've had these every other year. So perhaps next year will be our, our uh, this year seemed to have been our off year, but we don't know what's going to happen next year. And it, it, it seems that the trend was every two years. And it's good, I think, for Remo to have some some kind of a plan that that directs exactly what can take place during a during a drought. And the Nakeel Housing Corporation financial statements. And I don't know if everybody else, but they're upside down on my computer. I couldn't I, I couldn't uh, I tried to turn my my iPad, but it it turned with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't the easiest thing to read, for sure. Any questions or anything on those? Councillor Digden? Uh, thank you. I just checked on the our website, and they are upside down on that as well, but you can actually turn them around uh, with the mouse and that, that you can read them. Okay. So good. Yeah, they're good there. Yeah. So now... We have a couple of uh, financial requests, district community grant requests of 500, St. Andrews, Solo, Real Brook Signage Committee. And that's from, that comes from our uh, deputy warden. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to move um, that, we, that we give $500 in district community grant to the St. Andrews, Solo, Real Brook Signage Committee. They're looking to put up a community sign um, in in the area, so I'm looking to make that motion. Good, seconder, seconded by Council Board. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Another one, I guess that's yours as well. District that's community grant from the Belleville community sign. Yes, so this one's a little bit, um, a little trickier. So um, we have, we have formed a Belleville community group called Belleville, Belleville and Friends Community Group. So we're just in the early stages of forming a community group because they want to put up, they want to actually put up a couple of community signs, but there's no Belleville community group. So we're, we've started the process of, of incorporating so that we're a nonprofit um, organization. So our name has been approved and we're in the next steps to get our, our committee registered. So in the meantime, we wanna start the process of applying for grants. So I spoke with CAO Muse and he said, because we have this initial step done, it shows that we will have a, com a committee and we are able, I am able, or they are able to apply for a community grant. So I am looking to, um, to make a motion that we grant $500 for, uh, from my community, district community grants for uh, community sign in Belleville. Oof, seconded, seconded by Councillor uh, Boudreau. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Thank you. So we're up to agenda topics for next meeting or notice of motion. Councillor uh, CL Muse. Um, as part of the, I tried to get you when you were going through, but you were like on a mission. And I know that I, and, and when we did the audited statements and the presentation and approval, um, there was another uh, uh, document that I would that that I think is relevant and can be approved by you. This is something that I need to have for the application for funding for uh, FCM. 
And if you'll permit me, I can take four minutes and show you the, the, the audited statement. It's a special audit on the admin building. So I found it kind of, it's kind of good information for you. And also like, not just a special audit, but also the public will be able to see that the audited financials are reflecting that we are below budget. Um, that's also kind of a positive thing as well. So it, 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 I know it's not, it, it kind of got passed through the top, but if you, if you permit me to do that, yes. it, it would, I would appreciate it. Go ahead. So um, this would have been, so this is Grant Thornton that did the audit and, and the opinion and everything she went over. Uh, this is a special audit. So the opinion is a little, is a little different, um, but essentially uh, it, it outlines the audit and management responsibilities. So this is the schedule of building costs from the period of May 1st, 2018 to June 25th, 2021. Why June 25th? June 25th is the date of substantial completion. That doesn't mean it was completed. It means it was more than 90% completed at that time. So the costs that you see here were incurred as at that date, and this is the cost that was incurred. Um, so as you'll see, the contractor was a little over 3 million, the engineering and architect planning project management, 679. This, this is typical, uh, the percentage of this as a total of the project is typical and within the norm. Um, legal fees, advertising, furniture fixtures, fixtures and equipment. Uh, again, uh, we spent more than that in, in furnitures and equipment, but it happened after June 25th, which is in the notes and the moving costs uh, of 64, 65. I will say this, and I couldn't highlight this more, uh, I couldn't highlight this anymore. We put together uh, this budget and our, pro our project manager, Ian Everett was assisting us. And one of the things that he put in there was the management of the move. So this is not the move itself, but the management of the move. And the fair market value of that number is $20,000. And the municipality paid nothing. And the reason why it paid nothing is because the staff did it. So I just want to point out that there's a, there was a lot of sweat equity um, on my part and the part of staff to, to do that because that was not that. And, and that, of course, was to save money partially. Maybe we regret not spending it in, retro, in retrospect. But at the end of the day, um, it just it's a reflection of the commitment of the staff to try to get this thing done within budget. So in the notes, so, so what you'll see is this 3.751 that was spent from the beginning of the project to June 25th. Now the costs that are not included on that is the road because the road was a different project. So I just wanna make that clear. So uh, the eligible costs um, um, is, is stated in the agreement. This is based on the FCM agreement. And then in note two, which is the one I'd like to, 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 to show is that, is that since June 25th, we did incur additional costs most of which were budgeted. It's just a timing thing. The, like the bill didn't come in by June 25th. The biggest part of that is furniture, fixtures, and equipment, uh, which, which you see in each and every one of our, of our offices. And it, this number does not include the sale of old furniture, fixtures, and equipment that was shown separately. So there's a recovery of that, of, of, of about 10% of that number, but uh, uh, thus far, but, but, it's, uh, but, but that's, that was the cost. So an additional 60,000 was incurred in actuality, and we are expecting $341,000 as a holdback to be paid out to our general contractor once everything is completed. So as part of the contractual agree agreement, we pay 90% of the costs and the 10% is held back until such time as the project is reasonably completed and then it's released. So that's also uh, noted in there. So the total budget was 4.215 initially. We added another 50,000 for project management and we added another amount uh, in, in, in the, a smaller amount in the subsequent to that. And we are within that number. Um, and I would also note that we're within that number also including storage shed costs that were not part of the original project. So we were able to, we didn't finish the project. We we're not finished with the storage shed but the cost associated, the, the project only contemplated the movement of that, not the retrofit of it. And so we were able to retrofit it and still stay within the budget. So we're pretty happy with that. 
So this this is an audited statement. So this is not our, this. These are our numbers audited by the uh, Grant Thornton. And I guess what what it would require if you didn't have any questions and or or when questions are satisfied, uh, an approval or an acceptance. I think we accept actually these these statements because they're uh, they're they're basically uh, presented by, by professional auditors. So that's the extent of the report. Very very uh, very very short report. And I thank you for. Hearing. So 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 that was part of of their regular audit, like, or is just just a special report that they did. It, it's it's a special audit that I engaged them specifically. Okay. To, and okay. it was it was I needed to do that in order to get the the money. In those costs, does it uh, reflect the the uh, uh, the HST rebate? Yes, these costs are including. These costs include our portion of HST. So any HST that we recovered are not here. Okay. Covered. So these are the actual costs plus four percent HST, which, which is our percentage cost. Right. Okay. Good. Um, Councilor Boudreau. I'm just wondering, Alain, why is there two uh, um, uh, architect fees? There's one of uh, almost 700,000 and on uh, the list you showed us below, you have to spend an extra six or $7,000. Architect fees. Yes. Um, so those architect fees were simply, they were part of the budget. They were part of the contract. Yeah, I, un I understand that. But why is there another uh, $7,000 of architect fees? Uh, uh, because they they occurred after the substantial completion, so so the the invoicing was happened after June twenty fifth. Therefore, it's included down here and not part of the big one. And also, their work continues uh, even even with uh, uh, substantial completion because there are change orders and other administrative uh, matters that are required. So, okay. some part of the contract, and there was an extra amount paid to them for a special project. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Well, it's good that we, we you know, you don't usually start a project like that and end up under budget. Uh, okay. Danny. Yes. Uh, Alain, uh, in, in, in the uh, fees you've shown us, uh, does that include the uh, solar? Yes, it does, sir. Good, thank you. Very, very good, I think. I so move. Second, Kathy. What was that? Mo a motion to to adjourn? Is that what that was? <laughs> I didn't, yeah. To move, no, to move the, uh, to move that, that uh, what Allah showed us. Oh, do we have to move to that? To approve. Well? Yeah. Okay, so it's moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Contrary minded, carried. Well, if there's no other business, was there anything in the question period? No, uh, there was only a comment on the, uh, the doctor recruitment, just that housing was important, but no questions. Okay. And there's no in camera. So we're ready for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Deputy Warden, seconded by Councillor Sonia. All in favor? We're adjourned. <laughs>